hello there, people and listeners of the Hungry Cob Podcast. Today, I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome back uh, Giles Brook onto the podcast. Um, Giles is very much a food and drink uh, titan, has worked with so many, so many brands, Innocent, uh, Vita Coco, Bear, uh, Snacks, an investor in a well, myriad of brands, uh, Bio and Me, Pippa Nut, um, so I think it's real. The, the list is longer than my arm. I can't I even. My brain's just kind of escaping me. Um, but yeah, we did. We did an interview at Bread and Jam. It was. I loved it. There was so many things that my brain was thinking. Oh my god, I wish we had longer. Um, so super grateful you're back for a, a part two. I'm very excited for this. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about it actually. Um, so what, what I want to start with is we talked a, a lot last time about like the bigger. Um, like kind of the exits, the big exits you've done, what you're looking for with from with the investors cap on. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I th you said a few things which were just amazing, like be, be the hero of your category. Does the category have legs to kick on? Yeah. What I want to start with is actually going back to those early days, super early days when you almost put the hustle hat on, right? When you've got to graft your bollocks off. And there's a quote which I want to kind of use to open this up. And it's by a guy called Alex Hormozy, um, who's this kind of entrepreneur in the States. And he says, my biggest regret from my younger years, not taking enough pictures of the shitty times. Take them, be proud of them. They'll be part of the story you tell someday. I'd love to know, and we can either go into Bear or Vitacoco and Innocent. Uh, what are some of the looking back now, some of the, the moments and those dark days which you wish you could have taken pictures of to look back at now and be like, wow, I got through that. Yeah. Gosh. All right. That's a good opening. Uh, so just, I'll give you a few examples. I think Innocent was a good example as a business. So I was part of kind of the senior leadership team, Stroke Board, and perception versus reality for a couple of the years at Innocent were quite starkly different. And Everybody who looked at Innocent went, oh my God, what a brand, amazing, must be on a trajectory like this, gosh, incredible, blah, blah, blah. But we had a couple of year period whereby literally the whole thing almost imploded. Um, Sugar became a big agenda. Janet Street Porter, if you remember that name, she was pretty vocal about it. We had commodity prices going significantly um, against us. And there was also some general softening of demand in the marketplace. And actually it really impacted the business more than you, than you realize. And, you know, it threw us out for a long period of time. Um, and you also, this was a world where you also had all the competition coming in and doing, you know, we had brands coming in and doing like 46 weeks of buy one, get one free to try and take out, take out the brand innocent. And it was that, that was a really tough period, right? Because, and it was tough for a number of reasons. I think one, the business, expected success the whole time and actually not succeeding was not an option um and i think particularly for the senior management team there because of the caliber of the three founders as in richard adam and john hmm. you almost and to be let's be also be fair to them they didn't personally put any more pressure on if anything i would say they were they were they were, they were brilliant but just because you're working for and with such three intellectual and capable powerhouses it almost up the ante and it took us a long, long time to kind of work through what was the right strategy to get through a very, very difficult period of which Innocent came of it very well. But that was probably one of the most toughest periods in my career. I can remember for 18 months, I was running on vapor. What years it, just to give a time sample? Gosh, this? Um, I'm trying to think how long. I was only there for around about five years. I'm so bad on time scales. People even ask me when I went to university and I can draw a blank on those those dates. But it was probably, the best way for me to say, it was probably about three years before the Coke, the first Coke deal came in. That's probably when, obviously when Coke bought the first part of Innocent. So that 2005? To Could have been, yeah. It must yeah. have been because I can't, I can't even remember the dates I was there. Yeah, yeah. terrible. I can't even remember what I did yesterday, let alone. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, I think that was a really difficult time for us because, you know, it took us a long time to get it right because we tried a few things and couldn't. And in the end, and actually we also, there were a couple of people outside of the senior leadership team who actually stepped up and played a role. So some people looked at the pricing architecture and what we needed to do and did a great role. And there's a guy there called Giles, Giles, a namesake actually, Giles Carter. He played an incredible role at really helping us kind of turn around that business. So I think that that was one. I think at Vitacoco, you've got, I mean, look, 
I didn't, I'll be honest with you, I didn't have many dark days at Vitacoco. Uh, what an amazing journey. What an amazing business to be part of. What a great, you know, set of founders with Mike and Ira who were there. The dark days probably would have been the following, which were, <laughs> then the first one's going to be weird. Being a subsidiary, which effectively I was of a massive US parent company, Hmm. Um, it was great because it meant I wasn't as much in the spotlight. And also we ran the business that might let me get on and run it as if, own, if, as if it was my own business. And actually that's the only way it would have worked. But it was also problematic because we had a period for about the first two, three years where there was more demand than supply. And what that meant was that actually we couldn't get hold of enough product. Now you and I know that if I have to go and tell Tesco's, as to Sainsbury's, Waitrose, we can't fulfill your orders, it kicks off. In the US, they're like, no, no, you tell them we've only got this stock, they're getting that and they're lucky to have that, so they need to deal with that. And that was a really difficult time because mm. I was having to literally scrap and fight every day to try and get more stock release for the European business. And that, that, was, that, that was tough because, you know, equally and importantly, obviously the US domestic market always tends to take priority. But, you know, I guess back in those days when some of the debit notes started flowing through from some of the retailers where there was obviously, they were charging, you know, they were... Legally, it was questionable. Obviously, today it's been, it wouldn't happen today. But at one point, they were obviously charging us per case for lost sales. And when the US guys saw that, then a few more cases came flowing. So I think, I think that was one particular dark period with Vitacoco. I think another one which I was involved on the periphery of is that when you're in the US, when you're a massive pe- massive brand, unfortunately, the US market is very lit- litigious. Mm. quite a lot of lawsuits and consumer lawsuits so for example we would say like sticking a straw in a coconut and because we flash pasteurized and because we put it down a production line a whole lot of uh, lawyers in the US went well actually you're misleading consumers and published on the website right if you've had a bite of coconut in the last five years you can claim because they've been misleading you multi-million pound lawsuit I mean fright I can't if you knew the figures involved ridiculous and you know, that was, that was really challenging. And I, you know, I occasionally would get invited into the board meetings in the US and I was at that particular board meeting and, you know, we're looking at these telephone numbers of what it was going to cost us. But we actually settled it, even though we knew we could win it. And actually, we, we you know, we had, we had our own defense attorney and they were like, you can win this hands down. But it was going to take two or three years. And our main investor, Verlin Best, were absolutely fantastic. They were just like, look, we'll get through this. Tell us how much money we need and we'll get through it. But we settled it because even though Pride and Principle would have told you to do otherwise, it would have been a massive distraction for the business to have that going on. Mm. We swallowed it, just took the hit on the money and meant we could just then focus 100% on building that, building that business. Um, and then probably darkest day for me, actually my darkest day of my whole career is the following, which you, you'll probably laugh at this one, is that um, it's probably the day I left Fire Coco stroke the day I couldn't go when we IPO'd it in on the NASDAQ. So there was a selected group of, I think, six or seven of us who'd been there since inception, stroke with a kind of main senior team in the US. And the whole idea was uh, I was supposed to fly over um, and be there at the kind of the, um, the opening morning of on the NASDAQ mm-hmm. and the bell ringing and stuff. And, you know, when you've put in, you know, a decade, 12 years into a business that's been your whole life, um, there was one issue and that was COVID and I wasn't allowed to fly. Oh, and yeah. unfortunately you could go across most uh, countries by then, but unfortunately with the US, I still couldn't get into the US. I actually managed to get an exemption, but unfortunately it arrived at 11 PM and it was about five hours too late for me to get on a flight. So I missed that. And when you put in that much effort and also when you want to be there to celebrate with the guys, you, you, you've kind of been through everything within mm. the 12 years. That's probably one of the darkest moments for me. And, you know, leaving, leaving you know, I think, I think, you know, I was obviously involved with Haley and Andrew who, who, who ran Bear and who founded Bear. And obviously I helped support them grow that. And, you know, obviously we sold that business to Lotus and that, that was a tough day. But Vita Coco, because of the way that Mike let me run, it always felt like my own thing. And actually, when I left that business, that was a big hole. That was that, that mentally, that was quite challenging. I was re- I felt very lost for for quite a few months actually after leaving that business. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Honestly, it means the absolute world to me. Um, I'd be so grateful for a small favor, please. It is so hard running a YouTube channel. It's so bloody hard. Um, if you please enjoy these videos, just click the subscribe button. Um, 
more subscribers equals bigger guests. Bigger guests equals better conversations. And hopefully you can learn more as you build your food drink brand. Thank you so, so much. When you say very lost, how, what what the thoughts in your head? What's when you're out on the bike? You know, yeah. pounding, like, no, no, but it's interesting. Yeah, no. It's like well, yeah, I threw I, myself into that more, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, but, no, but I think yeah. that's when you that's on those yeah. long bike rides or runs or those moments of solidarity, solitary, yeah, yeah. Uh, solidarity kind of thing. Um, that can actually make you feel more lost, but you need to feel lost to feel found, is what I believe. Really, yeah, it, it was a tumble dry of things, right? It was everything from um, that's been my baby for twelve years. I'm now no longer with that business and there was a sense of loss you know like that, that you know and there was a there was a there was a big cavity that that was i was struggling obviously i was already investing in other businesses and you know doing a couple of bits of non-exec but it's not the same as kind of running your own ship now at the same time i also got to a place with that business where you know for example if you look at certain roles so obviously i was ceo and i was running it but we brought in that a managing director a lovely guy called tim reese Tim has just taken that business to a level, hand on heart, I couldn't have taken that business to today. And, you know, bringing in somebody like that who has such an impact, but also to a certain extent displaced me, right? Um, that was quite difficult as well. But, you know, Tim is still there today, still absolutely smashing out of the park, um, done an amazing job for the business, um, not just the European business, but the overall parent company as well. Um, but, you know, it was just that real... Sp- you know, slight loss of a stroke, slight loss, slight loss of identity. It wasn't about, just to be clear as well, Dan, it wasn't about egos or like, you know, I need to be seen as the guy who's heading on this sort of thing. It was just, I absolutely thrived and loved doing that day in, day out because it was like, you know, building a category from, it's not just building a brand, but building a category from nothing, coconut water, and making it one of the biggest success stories of, you know, the last two decades mm. was just so much fun and so amazing thing to do. And then to suddenly not have that anymore. But I kind of went on the journey after that saying, right, actually, do I do something like that again? And actually, I realized I didn't have the energy or the appetite to do that. Hence why now I've put on my own portfolio, getting involved in a lot of businesses. But equally, I couldn't jump back in and be a kind of startup founder again because I just mm. don't I don't have the energy or the, well, actually all the patience to do it anymore because it does require a lot of patience. That's what you've said there is, is going to be so valuable for people listening is, is energy and patience. Yeah. I think everyone, so many people listening to this will be thinking, I want to build the next Vice Coco, but I don't want to play the, they won't see the 12 year game. Yeah. They'll see the, I want it in three years. And you, you know what I mean? Yeah, but I think yeah, having yeah. one preserving energy, which is what we talked about a lot last time at Bread and Jam, when you were like, I'm going to say to my board, like if I need three hours on that, on the bike or yeah. to chill, I'm going to do it to preserve my energy and actually patience. And I'm the worst. I've got zero patience. <laughs> it's like I'm having to learn with trying to grow this, but it's, it's, it's kind of that going, going slowly. I want to talk about, so just to go back to the Vita Coco, um situation, because I've, I ne- I've never understood how it actually worked. So, so Mike's the founder in the U S did you call him up? Did he call you? Like, how, yeah. did, how do these things yeah, actually yeah. work? So the, the way it actually worked was that, so um, Verl Invest, guy called Eric Mullery, who heads up Verl Invest Fund and right. still does today, he got in touch and said, oh, um, got this thing called Coconut Water via Coco. I've got the innocent guy's blessing because I hear you're heading out. You're going to be launching a snacking business called Bear, but also I've understand you've got some capacity. Can we have a chat about it? And I said, well, funny enough, because... I've been looking on BevNet, which is US big, it's the big beverage website that everybody looks at in the US. When you look at anything, drinks, alcoholic, non-alcoholic, BevNet is literally the, the gospel in the US. And I just seen all the time popping up this coconut water, that coconut water. So I said, oh, I've seen it. Yeah, I see, I see exactly what it is. It also was in a couple of the health stores over here. So I tried it. And like everybody else, wasn't quite sure about the taste of it. Anyway, I met up with um, Eric and then Mike Kerbin, who's the founder, uh, one of the two founders, obviously Ira Liren is the other. And Mike and I had an afternoon in London and we struck up a deal. So he gave me the opportunity to kind of run Europe um, as, you know, effectively as a subsidiary of, of, you know, the main parent company. Um, so how does that work? So you've got, you have complete ownership of the company and give them a percentage, like a royalty? No, or? so we actually all, because we, we, we talked about different business models. Because yeah. at one point in time, I was like, look, actually, give me the rights. Let me set it up. Let me raise my own money. But fundamentally... If at some point in time you want to sell or float the business, that's quite complicated. Mm. And also, you know, with a backer like Verlinvest, what they very kindly did is they said, look, 
let's set it up as a subsidiary. You run the subsidiary f- for us. I had a very small initial stakeholding, but if I hit various milestones over, I think the original one was over six years. So, so you know, I had different, over, over each year if I hit a certain milestone, release more equity or more shares, you know, for, my, for myself. But they also uh, funded it for me as well. So it meant rather than me taking the risk. Um, and also to be fair as well to me, I, I had no money left at all because I'd also put a lot of money and guarantees into Bear, Bear as well. So my wife and I always joke, she kind of knows how much we were literally on the breadline, but, and it's all relative, obviously, but literally every single chip went onto Bear and Vita Coco that, 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 you know, mm-hmm. that, that, that I had. And we set it up that way. Uh, and that also worked. That's always worked. And actually, do you know what? And to be fair to Mike and, and, and Eric and the rest of the senior team is that, <laughs> You know, we got to year six and because of the job that had been done. We then overlaid with, you know, opportunity for me to earn more equity and stuff like that. And, you know, luckily I managed to hit all those numbers as well. And then floated the business on the um, US Stock Exchange um, through on the NASDAQ. Um, and my shares were on there. And, you know, that's been incredible because whilst you've watched some pretty high profile brands and other drinks, not just UK, sorry, not just um, global or US brands, but you've seen a lot of flotations where, you know, yeah, you've seen alternative, you know, alternative meat and all that sort of stuff. You've seen some horrific share price performances. You know, Touchwood, Vitacoco so far has done incredibly well. I think it, I, I won't remember the exact numbers, but it launched around about $15, $16. It's hit $30 today. So for an individual investor, you know, they've almost doubled their money, right? Mm. Which, if you look at the rest of the performance and, you know, other well-known drinks bands, I mean, it's literally the highest performing beverage stock in the whole of the US stock, mm. stock exchange at the moment. What does it take? Get, so I'm going to ask some dumb questions, right? No, not at all. Um, no, no such thing, is there? Yeah, 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 yeah. There's no such thing as dumb questions. <laughs> so how does a brand actually, like, float? Yeah. You know, like, what actually, it sounds so... Yeah, like, so I, I, wasn't, I wasn't heavily involved in that part, but I right. do know, I have, I've, but actually, I'm couple of my businesses I've been through looked at it I've looked at it, a couple of businesses on AIM I mean fundamentally it's generally a public offering right you are giving people an opportunity to buy shares yeah. in your brand it goes on on the stock market you will do what you call a pre-sell where you will go and speak to various different you know bankers investment houses about the business and everybody will come up with a valuation and basically a, a, a guide price for what the, you know what the initial share offering should be i.e. what the initial share price should be there's always some shenanigans with that and it goes back and forward and then effectively you say look this is how many shares you're going to put up for the IPO and then it goes live um, there's obviously quite a few have been pre-sold um, to the, invest, in the institutional investors and the, mm-hmm. and the banks and then it goes live and then you are then in the lap of the uh, well, I guess you're in the lap of your own own gods your own performance so I think you probably know but um Typically, most businesses have to give a quarterly earnings update, mm-hmm. and you have to nail your performance every quarter because you know one back one back quarter, and you can see you can see numbers, you know numbers, you know your, your share price can tumble pretty quickly, and we've seen that on quite a few businesses. And it's not just you know the, the bit, my own view, and again, everybody has a different view about IPO businesses, but you know it it you've just got to make sure that every quarter you're consistent. You've got to be completely transparent with your shareholder base, but also if you, you know, for me, it's about earnings. You've got to continually be delivering the profit numbers. You've got to. If you start hissing, hit, missing your earning numbers, people get very wobbly about listed businesses. Mm. That's the big thing for me. And you talked about being almost, and again, relative, almost on the breadline, right? You said to your wife, like, we're all in on this. Yeah. But with, with Bear and Vitacoca. And I think there's something happened. And the guys I was interviewing this morning, um, Toby and Tom from All Things Butter, is like, yeah. they call it pulling the trigger, right? So when, when you're actually all in, I think you manifest this force around you. It's like, this has to work. And I think it's really powerful. There will be a lot of people listening to this who are, have, have done that. They're all in. They're not, you know, not necessarily on the breadline per se, but like, what, what so... And I get asked this to ask guests about like the actual money part of the situation. Mm-hmm. So was was Vita Coca when you when was the first significant chunk of money you made? Um, well, like how did that change you? Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. Let, let me um, let me just I'm gonna reverse because yeah, 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 I'm gonna reverse yeah, that. I tell you one thing, which is quite you guys. This is going to be what listeners know are going to not going to want to hear. The beauty of what I've been part of or been able to do is if you actually look in terms of the European. Fire Coco business and the bear business, we grew that to relatively similar size. So let's just say 40, 40 to 50 million 
RSV sales, right? Both of those businesses, the Bear and the, and the Vitacoco Europe. But what's amazing is, is that with Vitacoco, we, we were lucky that we had a big investment vehicle behind us. Well, two or three, we had people like Verlinvest and some other investors, and therefore we had more cash to deploy to, you know, grow the, the brand of the business. But with Bear, basically, you know, I put a load of money in, the founders put a load of money in, but fundamentally, we never ever raised cash on Bear. We basically built Bear to that level purely by managing our creditors and debtors very effectively and our cash flow very effectively. We never raise any external funds to get Bear to that level. You try explaining to somebody that today and they'll just go, that's impossible. Yeah, well, that's fine. Look at you that now, mate. Yeah, no, we, we did it. And, you know, and everybody played their role in doing that. You know, back then we had a lot of the, you know, a lot of the customers obviously, you know, gave good uh, pay, you know, gave, were paying us, you know, and admittedly we took advantage of some early settlement, you know, fees and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that to yeah. do that. Andrew did an incredible job with our both because we, we 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 basically we outsourced all the um, the co manufacturing, but we actually sourced all the fruits and stuff ourselves, and then somebody um, prepared them all for us, which is obviously softly baked rather than, than than dry. But Andrew did an amazing job with those guys with getting us very good again payment terms and stuff like that, and we just managed to. There were also back then there were a couple of things that we did with the most people when you go to a bank they give you all their here's how we can help you, your money work harder for you and all that sort of stuff. And there's this beauty parade of their first tier products, but always ask what's in the second drawer below because in the second drawer below, there's normally some things where you can actually, you know, so for example, one of the things that we did was that um, we used to ship products over from South Africa. And what happened was... Bear. Yeah, yeah Bear. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, Bear used yeah. to ship product from South Africa. As soon as that product shipped over from South Africa, the bank took title of that product, mm -hmm. but they immediately paid the invoice and put the money into our account. So it meant that we got, we got cash straight away on a product that was coming over. They obviously held the rights of it. Clearly we paid it back once, obviously it all went through. But again, just clever tools and, and products like that, which aren't necessarily always available in that first tier of products, just helped us fund the business really well. But I think that, you know, the thing to say on this though, Dan, and this also comes down to people listening to this is, it also depends about what business you want to grow, right? And Vitacoca had aspirations to be a billion dollar business, right? Today yeah. it's sitting at a 1.58 million, sorry, 1.58 billion market cap. It probably, hopefully will go towards 2 billion market cap, right? Because it's growing and growing and doing a fantastic job. But Bear, you know, Andrew and Haley are the founders of Bear. They would never have ever wanted to take the business on that journey and actually kind of not raising a huge amount of money, not having a whole load of... Um, investors and doing it on their own terms was their preferential way of doing it. And that worked for them. And I think one of the big things is, is always, always be kind of, if, you, if you've got aspirations to start up a business, start it up and make sure that both in terms of yourself, but also with investors you bring on board, you're aligned with how you want to grow the business. It's like today, I'm happy to get in business, involved with businesses that go up to 50, hundred million. But somebody said to me, right, Giles, come on, let's, we're going to really get this one and make this the next billion dollar brand. That's not me, I've got to be honest. I just That doesn't excite me. Some people love, you know, making businesses as big as they can. Mine's the exciting, exciting bit, which is getting off the ground. Yeah. And then suddenly becoming, you know, like Bear and Viacoco are both UK favourite household brands. That's enough for me. I want, yeah, there's um, a lot to, to pull at and there's a lot that you've said some really interesting things that I, I want to tease out. So the, the first thing is... With Bear, let's, 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 let's zoom in on Bear. I think that's, this is the best example because I didn't realise that you hadn't actually raised money, right? And I think it's getting that zero to one, zero to one, yeah. um, not in terms of one million revenue, yeah. but that zero to one. And then you, as you said, with Vice Coca, you moved it on to someone else. Yeah. The guys, I think it was Mike or the guy's name, the other, the other MD who came in. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, Tim, Tim yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Mike's founder. Then you kick it on. So it's, it seems like you're good at this. You, you love this stage. Yeah. Am I right in saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's from everyone I've spoken to. I interviewed William Kendall last week and he said that is the hardest stage. And that's what most of our listeners are going on. What was the first, what are the first kind of the, the route to your first kind of million at, or, or even 500 grand at Bear look like? like? How did you take that? What was the deals that kind of made that happen? Whew, yeah. Um, yeah, the evolution was interesting for us. So early on, Waitrose and Sainsbury's backed us very heavily early on. 
And that's what really jettisoned us on very quickly. We also had some really nice listings with the likes of Holland Barrett, who were very supportive back in the day. And, you know, unfortunately, Wilkinson's as well. Wilkinson's did it. Because we also, because yeah, we, yeah. we also, again, to be careful how I say this, but I always used to smile because I had so many, you know what it's like when you're building a brand and a business and you've always got people who've got an opinion on it, right? Yeah. And I used to laugh and, and a little bit because we were absolutely clear we wanted to be the UK f- favorite fruit snack. And we're absolutely clear that doesn't matter what the brand name was above the door, if we knew putting the brand in that particular customer was the right thing to do, to do, to giving, you know, mums and dads or families access to kind of, you know, mm. nutritionally dense products like, you know, like, like, like Bear, that was the right thing to do. But, you know, you have people come in because I think we, you know, we went to come with what I would call some retailers such as Wilkinson's in, in very early on. People were like, oh, so that's not very strategic. Why are you putting this brand in there for so early? And it's like, well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's a bit, bit down market. Sure, it's not going to damage the brand. And I'm like, I don't care whether it's Waitrose or it's Wilkinson's. It's the right decision to put that mm. brand in there. And actually, I, I had to say, and again, it was, gosh, my gosh, I, I, I could have mentioned it actually earlier on as a dark moment. We had exactly the same, same conversation around putting Innocent into McDonald's. I mean, oh my God, when we did a trial with, with Innocent in McDonald's, yeah. which, you know, I went and brokered that with, with, with um, Adam, who's the founder, and we always wanted to be transparent. So we actually told our innocent consumers that we were going to trial with McDonald's. I mean, Richard Reed had death threats, right? The joke, yeah. I mean, some of the things, some of the things that came through in terms of hoping that he died and stuff like that, and then because it, people were so passionate about the brand and putting it into McDonald's, they could not get their head around at the time. And you know, for me, that was again where if somebody said to me today. So sorry, just to what? So what were you saying to your customers at Innocent? Because I think it's really interesting. So, so to our consumers, right? Yeah, to the consumers. So our, yeah. To our consumers, we were saying, look, guys, we wanted to be open with you. We're all about helping the nation, you know, eat get healthy, healthier, yeah, eat healthier. Yeah, yeah. I think you know, obviously, two or five a day as it was back there is really important. They've got the kids' meal deal. Right now, there's not a lot in there that really helps fulfil that that kind of that that way of thinking. We've got an opportunity to do a trial, so we're going to trial McDonald's. We want to let you know because you might see it in your local McDonald's and. Just we sent that out to what you know the innocent family, which is the you know the email database that went out, and it kicked off mm. big style. Mm. And you know, a load of us spent hours and hours fielding calls from you know, and, and, and fair play to the three boys and also Jamie Mitchell, who was kind of MD at the time. You know, spent loads of time on the phone all over weekends and stuff like that. And to some consumers, they were not going to move off it. That was it. You sold, you sold if you're putting in McDonald's. And there was, there was a number of things, which was people's perception of McDonald's, but also innocent as an independent business going into a corporate, you know, entity and an ugly entity that's apparently can do, you know, has done lots of bad things to the, to the world and the planet like McDonald's. They just couldn't see why that would ever be a relationship that should, should ever happen. And I have to, I have to be honest in, I think, I don't know, I'd be interesting. It'd be, somebody should ask Richard and John and Adam the same question, really. If somebody said to me today, if you were sat, knowing what I know now, would I still do that trial? I absolutely would. Because, because? Because I'm, you know, I'm very big on moral and ethics, ahead, ahead of sometimes business performance. Mm-hmm. And even though it might, it might have damaged the business a little bit, if it, gives every, if it gives people more opportunities to get portions of fruit, that's the right decision for me. I don't know you're going to upset some people doing that, but I still think it's the right decision. I, I don't think there's any place in today's world for, you know, I think any, any, any product that does good to a person or to the planet, whatever it is, making that as ubiquitous and as available as possible is good, whatever. And I, you know, I, I know people have different views on this, but. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, I'll be honest. I, and I, I love this. Why I like doing these conversations, right? Because you, you can test and see. Oh, am I wrong? Because yeah. I've always been on, along, along the kind of the, the mantra of your distribution is your marketing kind of things. Yeah. You know, the obvious one of like, if you're a Waitrose brand, don't go into say an Aldi or a Lidl yeah. or an ASDA. Like, work your way up. Like, you know. But then I suppose what you're saying, if if that's a way to put it in the consumers, um. Where the it, consumer but it, but it is. depends what your purpose is, right? Yeah. So going going back to yeah, yeah, yeah. innocent innocent is about the, being the UK's for you know UK, UK and then Europe's favourite smoothie company, right? Bear was about being the UK's favourite fruit snack. How can you be that if you're not prepared to go to those sort of sites? Given the odd size of the audience that goes in there, there's a disconnect, I believe, between your vision and that. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, I'm sure a lot of consultants who are a lot brighter than me and a lot more strategic than me, and also you know financiers who are much more business um, numeracy 
um, sailing than me will probably say, yeah, but it could be detrimental to the business. But I, yeah. I, I don't always make decisions based just on that. Uh-oh, I have just discovered a secret weapon. Please, please, please don't tell anyone. This secret weapon helps you get listed, stay listed, and most importantly, grow. This secret weapon is being used by absolutely banging brands like Bold Bean Co, Perfect Head, Neat, Trip, and Cheeky Panda. No wonder they're absolutely smashing it. But look, are you ready to get your mitts on this secret weapon and absolutely smash it too? I am thrilled, so thrilled to announce our brand new podcast partner, Northstar. What is Northstar, I hear you thinking? Northstar is a monthly subscription to an online platform giving you access to category data, category insights, anytime, any place, anywhere. It's basically the Netflix for challenger brands. It levels the playing field. Why do you need category data? Well, the first thing is making your pitch speak of the buyers and retail language is so, so important. It's gonna help you unlock more listings, unlock deeper distribution with existing clients, back the right NPD and actually understand how your competition is performing. But the even better news, are you ready to rock and roll at your next range of view? You no longer need to f- hire a full-time character manager. Instead, just parachute in Northstar within your next Waitrose, Sainsbury's or Tesco range of views coming up. They're your outsourced in-house partner. Save money. Their team will come in. They'll help you prep, plan and smash your next range of view. I'm so excited to be partnering with Northstar. Check them out in the episode description below. Delighted to announce the extension of our partnership with the wonderful Billy and Paul from Mackenzie Jones, but even more exciting. They have just launched a brand new brand as part of Mackenzie Jones called MKJ Ignite. MKJ Ignite is a recruitment firm which specializes full shebang focus entirely on challenge brand space. They work with some incredible brands, Lucky Saint, Good Rays, Purdy and Fig, Hunter and Gather, and Real Superfoods. They can support with your hiring needs across all levels, top to bottom, junior entry level jobs, all the way through M- up to MD and CEO level. So if you're looking for a field sales stomper, a sales wizard, an ops guru, a supply chain sensei, uh, you name it, MKJ Ignite can help you out. And look, if you're looking to wet your whistle, ignite your curiosity, then check out the poddy we recorded with them back in July laden with wisdom all about like do's and don'ts of hiring and like how to create the perfect job description you will love it how do you navigate how do you tell like the waitrose because i always find it interesting is how do you say to waitrose oh by the way um we're also going into an audi or um innocent is the you you know like started as kind of the the guys from um, oxbridge you know and and then goes right we're gonna go into mcdonald's Mm -hmm. how do you i think they're slightly different right because i think that Traditional bricks and mortar supermarket going into Audi is going to be friction, right? Because Audi Lidl, you know, whether we like it or not, if you look at the cross shop purchase, all their steel is all their consumers are coming from Waitrose, Sainsbury's, Tesco. So, what if you're going to go into Audi or Lidl, which you're completely entitled to, there is a potential that um, Tesco, Sainsbury's, Asda, etc., won't see you in the same light again because it gives them a lot of problems and headaches. Um, Brands need to make their own decisions about that. Um, my own view on it is I think you've got to make a decision based on the, on the image of your brand. Mm. When it comes to going into a, you know, into a retailer who might be more contentious for different reasons, such as McDonald's, or, you know, we know that, for example, there's another example, a lot of people, suppliers are criticised for working with Primark, for example, because of, you know, how they were, they were procuring their clothes and all that sort of stuff. I think that's a different matter. And what you have to do is, I think mean, you have to look at the business you're concerned with and make a judgment call. I, you know, damn for me, I think there's, the, the, the bottom line on this is I don't think there's a wrong or right answer. There's a judgment call, right? And you've got to make that judgment call. But, you know, for me, when it came to, you know, on Bear, particularly with, you know, fruit snacks and the fact it was all predominantly around kids' fruit snacks and, you know, based on what we knew kids were eating in packed lunches every day, wherever we could get available, if they were going to switch in for a bear, that was a win for everybody all the way around. Yeah, it's, it, I like finding the nuance in things. And it's, because even I've seen on LinkedIn, these these little um, or Aldi, like Wiggits, when it's, when it's gone, it's gone. I'm thinking, why are you doing that? But then it's like, well, actually, if your mission is to feel, like yeah. feed these many mouths, then it's worth doing. I think there's a brand who did like an own label for, um, I probably can't say who it is, an own label for Aldi. Yeah. Um, but if it fulfills, they've got a big purpose behind that mission yeah. where they give snacks back to um, exactly. people in in uh, 
like third world countries and so i think if that fills your mission then it's worth doing so uh, yeah i think it, i think it's fascinating we've talked a lot about innocent and and vita coco when when we spoke last time um at bread and jam you said something that was really really interesting and you said kind of innocent was very data driven whereas the, the <laughs> vita coco founder mike said bollocks to data which yeah. i think was hilarious yeah i am very much the bollocks to data kind of guy and I, i'd love to know why i'm wrong on that and why why what innocent we're looking at uh i don't think again there's a wrong or right i think it's just based on the individual well, put it this way when you've when you've got a business like innocent and two of the founders have come out of two of the top business consultancies and been top of the game in that industry mm. Not surprising, they're going to be insights driven, right? Mm. Mike was much more of a fly by your seat, your pants, intuition guy. You know, Mike also had other business interests, which he'd done off a hunch that were also incredibly successful, as successful as Vice Such Coco. as? Oh, so he created that whole hotel um, hotel room booking system. Globally, that's one of the most used systems around the world still today. Fuck. So he's, in, he's in, Mike's, Mike's an incredible guy, but things also evolve over time. So if you look at something like Mike today, Mike will be more 50-50 today. But that's also because the stakes have changed, right? Because, you know, back then it was him and Era, him and Era, and the buck stopped with them. And actually they were prepared to make decisions. You know, Mike was rollerblading up and down the streets <laughs> in New York delivering <laughs> stock. That's literally how it was. But, you know, when you've got investors in board and other, some, and, uh, and other people in board, and more importantly, when you get to, get to a stage where it becomes more difficult to get, kind of get your next set of growth and your next set of consumers who you want to bring on board, you're going to use data as well alongside you know, uh, along, along, alongside intuition. But I'm still a big believer of today that I will always, I'll always tend to favor intuition ahead of insights. And I think I told you that, that the, um, you know, when, when we launched Bear, all of the qual and quant said we shouldn't launch Bear. It won't work. What did it tell you? It basically said it wouldn't work. It said, oh, it's too gimmicky. They won't like it. The market doesn't need it. There's already, um, um, things like fruit winders and stuff like that out there. They won't get the fact it's just, pulped fruit and it's all softly baked and stuff like that and also the format and the reel won't work and cards are so yesterday and you know people don't you know panini and all that and actually the cards became one of the most successful things i mean you know it was the, the biggest challenge we had was that I, I i'd love to know what the figure was but you know schools around the whole country were banning bear cards because they were being traded so much at breaks and lunch times <laughs> it was just distracting everybody at, you know at school which was a lovely thing to ha happen from our perspective albeit you know it's uh it gave us some challenges as well, but I don't, I don't think there's a wrong or right. I think over time you'll, you, you, you know, you'll, 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 you'll use a mix of intuition and insights. But I don't know. I'm. It's we all have head versus heart decisions, and I, I look at both. But ultimately, I'll always, my heart will always try and mm. lead, lead and pick out. Yeah, again, it's more, it's more, more nuanced. I think I always thought of intuition or heart versus data as head as these two kind of opposing beasts in yeah. the mind of like okay one's got to win and actually it's like how do you how do you bring them both to the to the same side of the table and actually think and almost make make data and and the intuition into like a partnership to yeah the best thing go, going forward oh, the, the best thing in the world is when both the intuition and the insights guys are both right yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, if, yeah if they're yeah. both right everything works right so what with Innocent and and any any of the brands you've worked with, what do you think brands should, from the data perspective, really be looking at? And then what do you think is a bit superfluous and a bit of a, a waste of time? Because yeah. data can, you can get bogged down in data and you it can get, slow you down. You lost your own backside on it, right? Exactly. And yeah. also there's another big thing, which is data is so expensive. And, you know, a particular bear of mine, and even though today there are some a new platforms, such as you might have heard about Elm, for example, but, yeah. um, oh my God, Category data, you know, buyer and me, which as you know is one of my one of my involvements where I'm lead investor. Um, you know, we operate in cereal and yogurts. Oh my God, the cost, the six figure number to buy data in cereal when you're a startup brand is just so prohibitive. It's ridiculous. Mm. Um, so I think, look, there's a number of ways to answer that, which is the number one thing for me when I'm looking at data, and actually something I learned again, key referencing about innocent was that. Any board meeting, the first thing, the first agenda item was, what's our fact? What, what are our consumers saying? So you know, most people will start with the PL and go, right, let's how's 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 variance versus budget and variance last year? What's the balance sheet and everything like that? Innocent was like, right, no, what what have our consumers told us this month? And actually, I think that's the number one data. And by the way, it's not expensive, right? Because you create everybody creates their own family, right? So all yeah, all of my businesses I'm in now 
have a between a thousand to you know fifty thousand consumers that are on their database who they interact with regularly that they have built up they communicate with whether it's weekly newsletter or you know buying directly off the website or you know maybe entered a competition or whatever that is the most powerful tool you can have because you then have direct access to ask your consumers you know why do they buy your product what do they like about your product what don't they like about it what should we do next right mm. and that is the cheapest and most effective way so anybody who's setting a business up today don't lose sight with that but more importantly bloody listen to what they're saying because yeah you know, i've seen i've been in businesses and i'm speaking i've seen things when i can see some complaints coming through which don't look as if it's many per million right but i can see a trend be like oh that's fine just, just, no it's not fine we need to address that now mm. we need to look at that yeah but it's only that number i know but it's been for the last five months in a row and you know and things like that so I think then the next set of data for me after that is, and again, it depends on what you're trying to do, but if you, let's just talk with you know, a lot of your audience are people who are trying to launch brands in food and drink, right? Um, as of when you can afford it, category data is critical because everybody can go and sell an emotion or say, oh, I'm, you know, in this independent store, this chain of eight stores, I'm selling at 20 units per store per week, blah, blah, blah. Right. If you can use data and show, look, actually, look, we're now in the top 20 SKUs in this category. Look who we're selling. By the way, you've got all that space here. They're all below me. So I think we can, we should have that space there. That's a classic where, you know, using facts ahead of emotion will give you a better chance of being successful in pitching into new customers, but also extending distribution wider in existing customers. I think shopper data then is the next important thing. Sorry, just for listeners, the, the difference between category data and category shopper data. Category data is basically it scans store sales, right? Yeah. So that's how many units you're selling per week, um, what the app, what what your what the revenue you're achieving is. So it will spit out things like your average price. So you know if you're like at two pounds, but you promote down to one pound, it may say your average price is one pound sixty six based on how much has been sold on deal versus how much full price. It'll give you your distribution. But what's also so clever, quite quite clever as well it'll give you what something called weighted uh, rate of sale and weighted distribution. And that what that does is that takes brands that are all in the same stores and will give comparative reads for how you're performing. Because if you're not careful, let's just say uh, Bio Me is in 500 stores, but Jordan Cereal is in 2,000 stores. We can't compare the like-for-like -like sales in that. But what it does is it will take the 500 stores that Bio Me are in and look at how... Jordan's are performing those same 500 stores. So uh, you're looking yeah. at like for like sales performance. Okay. Yeah. So that, that, yeah. that's a category data. And then obviously shopper data will then look at, and typically it will be where it's either through a panel, which is done or else obviously the likes of well, virtually all the supermarket now have loyalty cards, but that were where you'll be able to look at your, you know, your frequency of purchase, your weight of purchase, your penetration, how many people are buying you, um, what you call your affinity index, what else are people buying, so what's, in, what's in my basket? So I'll tell you, you know, so for example, on Bear, we quickly found out that actually, unsurprisingly, one of the best cross promotions we could do was in fresh, with, 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 with like fresh fruit. You know, we, uh, you know, we, we kind of, we used to, uh, whenever anybody bought blueberries, a deal would pop up on Bear and people right. would buy us and stuff. So it just, it, again, the shopping metrics. And then I think the last one to buy, and the reason why I say it's the last one to buy is more consumer data, which is things like, um, you know, your kind of your loyalty rates, your brand awareness prompted and unprompted and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's probably the last one to buy because it's expensive, but also you have to be of a certain size for the data to be valid on that sort of stuff. And and if if you're not a certain scale of brand, you're best as conducting your own qualitative or quantitative research on trying to understand your consumer a bit more. But like I said, and I flip back to what I said originally don't dismiss building up your own database of consumers and speaking to those and, and, and more importantly imp uh, rewarding them regularly as well and do you think you can use say you've got an email list of 2,000 shoppers or sorry con uh, customers yeah. consumers who you've almost built that I know it's quite vogue and very American say tribe tribe yeah, yeah. man <laughs> um, but is it possible to to use that data to then speak to the retailers if you're a smaller brand uh, or how you, would you use that you could yeah you can definitely use that data to you know if Depends. On, the way I answer that is that what is the barrier or what is the challenge that when given about why somebody wasn't, doesn't want to support you or else what's the message you want to ram home? Find the data point that best represents that, yeah? And so, for example, let's just say, 
Okay, let's just, I want Surreal, which is one of obviously um, my other brands, which is kind of a, a little bit of a, like a keto, you know, keto cereal play, right? Which is absolutely flying as well. But it tastes delicious. Yeah, great product, yeah. amazing product, right? Um, you know, those guys there are obviously it's a slight, slightly higher average price than, than, than typical cereals or, or you know, or, or, or premiums, premium cereals there. You know, in that example there, they need to be able to demonstrate that actually, there is people are looking for that kind of high pro, high pro, high protein, low stroke zero carbs and sugar stuff. Use the data point to demonstrate that. And they, for example, have generated so many sales in D to C or through other channels such as LinkedIn and stuff like that. And they can show how strong the demand is. But importantly, they can see the customer profile of who's buying it, and they can take that customer profile and say, "Look, that's the profile of the person buying us. By the way, that's your average customer. Have you seen the crossover?" Um, and you can, again, you just pick your data points to try and you know, marry it with the story you want to try and tell. Pick your data points and marry it with the story you're trying to tell. I love that. And I suppose stories are intuition. Usually, you know, yeah. in culture, stories are very much heart intuition. But what you said there is amazing. Like use the data to, 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 to put almost wind in this in your yeah. in your story. Um, I want to talk about kind of going back. I, I, I jump around and I, I meander around. But we were talking about going from, you know, Bear going on that journey. And I think what we've talked there about using data and intuition or or which order really helps with that journey. But I'd love to talk about negotiation and brands and even myself, you you just feel when you're a minnow that you've got no legs to stand on. And one negotiation can completely part of my French fuck you right yeah what are some of the ba- the principles you must have been in some really tough negotiations what are your principles of negotiation you think for small brands right now I'd say this is probably the number one area that I think is fundamental to being successful and not successful today and it's really interesting because I just I'm not really a big user of social media stroke things like LinkedIn but have been on LinkedIn a bit in the last two weeks and it's amazing because there seems to be a bit of a conversational confessional conversational thing with various founders saying do you know what if I knew that now I would do this and fundamentally for me is that when you're a minnow you're trying to get a listing and there are unfortunately some harsh realities if you are a startup challenger brand and you want to get into one of the big guys you are going to have to give more margin than the category average unless there is a completely incredible, unique dynamic. And a couple of examples, maybe like that, were like Little Moons or a Fever Tree who had so much groundswell and power because they were doing so well. A retailer, oh, I'll give you another example, Prime, right? So take Prime as an example, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There could be examples where they actually haven't had to give the category average margin or else haven't had to give the other margin of the challenger brands because, you know... They were so on trend and so hot and that, you know, the, the supermarkets were desperately to get them in. But typically for the majority of brands, you just got to accept you're going to have to give more margin, right? Than the category average because, you know, all, every single category is having its space reduced. Every single category is having ranges rationalized. And also importantly, every single new product that goes into a fixture is having less and less time to prove itself. It used to be about a year. I've known brands come out after 10 weeks now if they're not performing, right? You've got to go and you've got to perform. But the the, the one message that I want to land and I'm seeing more and more and, and people talking about it is that be really clear from day one, you have to operate a business with a certain level of gross margin. And I, I think I mentioned to you We talked about this last time. Yeah, and obviously yeah. gross margin, just for anybody who's listening, is just very simply the invoice price you charge a customer, less your promotional discounts, less what it costs you to both produce it and deliver it to that customer. So just keep it as simple as that. There are slightly different definitions, but and typically in food and drink, you want that to be minimum 30%. Ideally, you'd want that to be 40%. Gold standards, 50% and above, right? Because if you're not generating good gross margin, you're continually chasing your tail because either one, you're running out of cash the whole time or else you just haven't got any money to invest in people, in marketing, in infrastructure and, and, and things like that. And that's the number one thing I see where, you know, I pick up some some PLs and some businesses. Obviously, I get quite a few investment memorandums where people are obviously fundraising and stuff. And I'm seeing some gross margins in like 
I mean, I hate to say it, but like, I, mean, I see quite a few in like the 15, 20, 20, 25 percent. I'm like, you just not, you can't, there's no sustainable business there. You've got to make a gross margin. And I hate to say it, but you know, in the meat alternatives, you know, I've seen these businesses with like single digit gross margins. Oh, we think we can get it to 15% in the long term. I'm like, it's still nowhere enough because it's, it's not a viable business because you've got no money. You're not generating any money to then kind of build a business underneath it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's my number one thing, which is, you know, there may be an amazing listing for you, but just make sure you can go in a, in, in a way where you know you can, you know, let's just say, for example, give an example without let's just say right i would generally say look try and make an average of 35 percent. but let's be honest let's just say one of the top four supermarkets offered you a listing you're going to make 25 percent. do it right if you go to all through negotiation you can't get a better deal do it but if that's more like 20 15 10 don't do it because that sort of size volumetric customer and the percentage of the mix means you're always going to be chasing your tail on margin Mm-hmm. And I know some people go, oh, yeah, oh, if I get that in now, don't worry, because I can go back, because hopefully, you know, I can buy bigger packaging runs, I can get cost of goods up and all stuff like that. And do that analysis, but typically you can't make it up enough. And the, and the, and the scary thing is, and this is, the, this is the elephant in the corner of the room, is that you're going to have to invest more every year because you'll have to increase your promotional spend. Rate cards go up for things like shelf ticketing or whether you want a gong or end or whatever. And it, the cost of doing business will keep going up. Um, and then there's also one other big harsh reality, and it's something I've been fairly vocal about in the press recently, is that multinationals over the last few years have been able to put through some pretty big cost price inflation increases, multiple digit, double digit ones. Startups and challenger brands have either had to only pass on partial or have had to shelve them because they haven't had the balance of power to push those through. So again, what that essentially meant is that gross margins have been even further suppressed. And, and I've really struggled with that one because, you know, it, yeah, the big corporate suppliers can push through the price increases. There's obviously been some fallouts, which has obviously been well documented in the press with certain products being taken off until it's been sorted out. But when you're a small brand and you go in there, and don't get me wrong, I completely understand the pressure the buyers are on in the supermarkets and stuff, but... You know, when I know there's guys who are trying to put single digit price increases through, which is only a fraction of what they need to put through, but are still being told, if you put that through, then you're probably going to lose listings, but we're not going to have the same relationship. And you need to basically, you know, forgo it. That's tough. Because I think bor- business moral and ethics, I don't think that's right. Mm. And yeah. what's even worse, by the way, is us, and, and again, because I, whilst I have my own portfolio, I speak to a lot of people on a weekly basis because I always like people, always happy people want to talk to me and just kind of, confidentially chat with me on stuff. And what's even worse is it's quite a few, well, there's at least five brands that I've spoken to in the last two weeks who are saying, can you give me some advice? I said, well, I'll try. And they basically swallowed all the inflation because they were told wasn't going to be allowed to put any more through. And then they've done that. So they're not me with the cost price. And as we know, and I want to be really clear on this, in-store pricing is 100% the decision of a retailer, yeah? But you imagine being a startup business where you're making less and less and you've been told you can't put any inflation through. And then even though they've not changed their cost price, they're now seeing that that retailer has now changed their shelf ticket price up by 10, 20, 30%. Because as a business, they're either not making as much money, so they're going, well, just bang that up. Or else they're using that money then to try and price fight on the bigger, you know, kind of KVI mm. on the big items to, you know, fight. fight KVI. Risky. So uh, key, key, key volume or key value item. So, you know, that will be typically, you know, or, or you, you know, like the, the grocer does a top 33 basket. It's all those sort of products that go into that basket where they have to be price match everybody else. And obviously there's the, you know, the, the big supermarkets are always against discounters on trying to be as, you know, as competitive against that. That takes a lot of money. And of course that money's got to come from somewhere. So hence why you start seeing some other challenger brands and stuff, their numbers have been, you know, they're, they're on, they're, on-shelf prices going up, even though they haven't moved their cost, their, their cost price, and even though they haven't, you know, and they've swallowed the impression. And I get it from a buyer's perspective, but God, from a business ethics and values point of view, I struggle with that. How do we solve that problem? I know it's, 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 it's again, there's probably a lot of nuance and no right or wrong in this, but I think if you zoom out, 
it's like I think the brands are going to lose because they're either going to go bust. Yeah. The retailers are going to lose because they're going to lose the zest yeah, and yeah. the life of the challenger brands. If we look at it over a twenty-year period, but like, how do you how do you think brands solve that? And how do you think? Well, I, think I think at the moment, and it's something I've been talking about. I think there's a, almost like there's a perfect storm, and I've called it like you call it either the three C's or the four C's, which you've had. You know, you've had COVID. Yeah. You had you know crisis with, with, with Ukraine. You've had a cost of living crisis generally. And then also you've had climate volatility, which has caused a lot of issues, you know, both in terms of just general demand as well as commodity prices and that sort of stuff. And that cocktail there has been an absolute nightmare for mm. everybody, but particularly for startups. And, you know, if you look at today, if you're a startup, and I talk about this, I think it's a lot of entrepreneurs who I knew were, were going to set up businesses. Some of them are challenging whether they actually are today because the risks are so high relative to the diminishing returns or diminishing rewards that they're really challenging what they're worth doing. And, you know, I talk about things like, you know, they can't pass inflation on, which is really difficult. I've been in this business now, doing what I'm doing now for 25 years. I cannot think of a more challenging time to raise money and try to get funds is so difficult. And if you can get funds, you're having to really, really drop your valuations. And they're off also coming with anemic terms, i.e., you know, what, what the conditions that come around it aren't, aren't, you know, aren't, aren't good. And then also then if you just step back and think, well, you've then got the government who have changed the rules around things like R&D, research and design, and, and design um, credits. So they're more difficult to get that support. Entrepreneurs Relief, you know, Rishi Sunak back in 2020, drops it by 90%. Obviously, it used to be the first 10 million, now it's the first 1 million. You sat there with all these dynamics and you're like, as an entrepreneur or as, as a budding entrepreneur, you're like, I'm not sure I'm going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's tough. And it's tough. And I, I am very vocal that I think the government needs to step in and support more heavily. There's a few pockets of things happening, but not nowhere near enough. You know, I don't think they can necessarily get involved with the inflation conversation we just had. Albeit, I think over time, I hope the supermarket leaders and stuff will make sure that small suppliers are treated fairly in, 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 in discussions like that, because I think they should be. Um, I definitely feel there needs to be more government-backed funding assistance. You've got a few things like the FSC loan and a few other loan schemes, but most brands can't get onto it. So we've got to find a way that people can get more, more access to funds. Um, and then I think there's a bigger thing, which is, I think the government needs to look at creating much bigger support infrastructure network to support startup and entrepreneur brands. So centers of excellence. So whether you want support in just how you start up a business, you know, find the financial side of things, how you build a brand from a marketing perspective, um, you know, um, how, how, you, how you set up the best procurement manufacturing, creating regional centers of excellence are really important. So for example, you may not be aware of it, but in the Northeast of Scotland, so I'm speaking at something called the, the Times Future of Food Summit at the end of November. And one of the things I'm really, really excited about finding out out there is that there's a £27 million uh, backed, which I think the government's put about 15 of the 25, 27 million in, something called the One Seed Pod up there, which is amazing because it's a whole centre for entrepreneurs that includes giving them manufacturing and production support, that basically a whole centre up there that basically for budding entrepreneurs to go in there and basically get as much support and as advice and, and mentoring as you can as part of that. So, you know, so I just think, you know, the headline is for me at the moment is that the UK has been globally, I believe, the leading country for entrepreneurism and startups. I think today that is challenged more so than ever in the whole of my career. And I think if we're not careful, we're going to lose a load of very capable and very amazing entrepreneurs who should be the next kind of Richard Branson's, Joe Malone's of this world, et cetera, because they're just not going to go on the journey. Because like I said to you, the risks are too high relative to the uh, kind of you know, ever reducing rewards. Oh my God, I am so, so, so excited. It feels like Hungary is finally swimming in the big leagues. I can't even believe this, it's absolutely mental. But delighted to announce that Big Fish, yes, Big Fish, are part of the podcast. Perry's been on the podcast three times. Listeners absolutely love it. Some of my most downloaded and cherished episodes of all time. But Big Fish are behind literally so many brands in your cupboard, in your weekly shop. Charlie Bigham, Year Valley, Tyrrells, Clipper Tea, Goo, Rana. I mean, make the list is longer than the River Nile. 
but they also share risk and invest in brands that they really believe are a force for good. They're brands that they believe are going to be the next big thing, like Howder, the snack that gives back. But even more exciting news, Big Fish want to speak to the next wave of small challenger food and drink brands that are destined for big things, the raconteurs, the movers, shakers, buccaneering visionaries. So look, if you want to speak to Big Fish and just have a chat, get your brand in front of them, then drop me a message. My mate Louis from Local Beer, amazing beer, was in their office, aka La Fish Bowl, uh, last week chatting to Perry, Freddie and the Big Fish crew. So drop me a message if you would like to speak to them. Boemi, our beloved sponsor, are helping build the fastest growing challenger food and drink brands. Look, if you're a small brand just starting out and need your first indie stockist, your first hundred stockists to wholesale, Boemi are the platform to categorically speed that up. But if you're a big brand wanting to get bigger, Boemi are also insane. They make field sales marble smooth, silky slick. They're just epic. Ollie's, Ollie's been on this podcast twice actually. They saw a 29% uplift in sales when using Boemi to check major malt listings availability. Insane. 29% uplift by downloading an app. Insane. Lucky Saint, my boy Aaron Duff, who's coming on this podcast in a couple of week, weeks, he uses it to manage a team of 30 people. And they've, Lucky Saint, have unlocked 500 draft listings by using Boemi. Look, you've got to get involved with this stuff. It's absolutely insane. And it will categorically change your life. It's just the sickest platform. I use it all the time at Islands. What's fascinating <clears throat> is how on social media, the desire to be an entrepreneur and a founder is so, has, be, has, be, has never been bigger in my eyes, but the reality on the ground is so different. And I was talking to Simon from Who Gives a Crap, you yep. know, that, yeah. yeah, yeah, and we were talking, and I was saying at uni, it was cool to go in, ironically, we're in the city right now, but it was like, go and be the investment bank, Wolf of Wall Street. It was like, I want to go and be a slick Rick in the city. Yeah, yeah. And they, I left uni in 2016. So, and over now, in that last, whatever, how many years, now it's like, oh my God, you're going to go into the city to sell sell your soul. Yeah, yeah. Go and be an entrepreneur, yeah. go and be a founder. Yeah, so yeah. Found, found, food founder specifically is very in vogue. Um, and I, and I, which is amazing. It's like it helps yeah. this podcast. But then the reality is, it's is it, is it's, it's stark. Big, yeah, exactly, that's the thing. Which is the aspirations are all there. Yeah, but the pressures, the challenges. As I said, the ever reducing risks. By somebody actually starts, people get to the detail. They start doing a bit of head scratching. Go, I really want to do this, but do you know what? Can I actually do this? Mm. Should I do this? And so, that's the bit for me, which is. I really, really feel that, you know, there needs to be government intervention because I think, you know, I've always said this, but entrepreneurs are the heartbeat of the, of the, of the UK for me. It's a phenomenal success stories. And I also say within every single market and category, the category is always better off and the consumer is always better off if there's a challenger brand breaks through and does well in it. And I just think we've got to create an environment which inspires and supports entrepreneurs to kind of mm. continue to do what they've been doing so over the last few years. And I think that's really important with getting the UK out of the current economic slump as well. So for founders who are feeling a bit mor like morbid, but morbidly paranoid, which is probably a good thing. It's like, this is, this is the situation. What would you say to them? Is it go slower? Is it, as in say they're listening yeah. to this podcast, is it go slower? Is it hang in there? What, what's the the antidote to this weird kind yeah, I mean, look, of epoch? If within, that's all, within all this, right, there is so much opportunity and upside still, right? Yeah. I mean, look, we know brands such as Biome, Lucky Saint, you know, Pippin Nut, which is another one of mine. Those brands, you know, are very resilient and doing incredibly well and going to be household, you know, already are and will be even more so like household favourites, right? So there's still huge opportunity there. I think the big thing is, is that I think you've just got to think a little bit differently about how you do it, right? I think you've got to be leaner. You know, yeah, one of the things I've, I talk about as well is that everybody thinks to be really successful, oh, I've got to put the office in London. I've got to build it all in London. So true. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. My biggest advice is don't. Biome is up in Chester, right? Yeah. It's cost-based. It's a fraction of the majority of startups because they're up in Chester, you know, incredible culture, amazing office, um, really high capable people up there. And it all works brilliantly, right? And they also, Ch Chester and the local community and the council and stuff, give them massive support. Because guess what? They are doing so much good for that part of the, part, 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 you know, that region of the country. Yeah. Um, yeah. And John and Megan are, are running that business, you know, are getting them really applauded for that, which, which is great. So I think, look, 
challenge whether you need to be in this, always be in London. Because everybody goes, well, you know, all the market agencies are there. They used to say loads of customers are there. Actually, aren't that many, as many customers as you used to be down here, right? And, you know, and, and, and lawyers and et cetera all down there. So I don't, I don't think that's as true anymore. But just create a lean operation would be my, 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 my advice. I think the second thing as well would be if you're going to go with what I call a high octane model, which, and what I mean by high octane model is that if you are going to literally raise a lot of money and you're going to go really go gangbusters for this, um, just be mindful that that is very high risk at the moment because you're going to, valuations aren't anywhere near like they used to be. If you run out of cash and you raise again, it's probably going to mean massive dilution very quickly. Um, and I think also you'll be under pressure to make numbers work really well. And, you know, it's, the world is changing. It's just the whole thing. It's similarly, you know, I can, I can kind of go on about it for hours and hours, but I'm talking about that from starting something today, but also like if, if I'm, if I'm a business that's, let's just say I'm between, I'm on two, year two to year four of my journey. And let's just say I'm between two and five million turnover, but I'm still got 15 to 30% losses. One of the biggest things I'd be saying to them is like, get yourself to break even and get your gross margin to a, to a good level, get your cash burned down because also the world's changed. Cause like, you know, I, sp I spend a lot of time raising money at the moment across my different businesses and, you know, the, the sentiment of the majority, not all, but the sentiment majority of institutions, i.e. like private equity and stuff has changed. They're just, you know, beforehand, if your gross margin's fine, but you're making losses, it's fine. They're all like going, right, tell me how quickly you can start making money. When are you going to break even? The world's changing the way of thinking. But similarly, these guys as well, because of the cost of borrowing, they might have said, look, historically, we need to make two to three times return over the period of our fund. They're now saying, oh, you've got to make three. We need to, basically, we need to make three to four times what we put in over that same entire period. So people have just got to be wise to that and think differently in the business. It's still massive opportunistic. And I always believe in, in tougher times that you can be even more successful in tougher times because you, you know, you, you kind of, you learn you've got to operate and work in a certain way. Mm. And, you know, for me as well, I don't, I actually want to just to slightly rewind on that. I don't actually think there's any such thing as good or bad times. The best business is just ride cycles, right? We live in a cyclical world, right? There will always be troughs and peaks, right? Mm. Create a business model that gets through those as best as possible. That's mm. what it's all about. The not being in London thing is fascinating. And it goes back to, you know, I was saying at uni, and that was really cool to yeah, be a yeah. founder. Is it's, is, I was speaking to my mate about this. Is It's like, do people actually want to have a brand or and own, be a business owner yeah. and create something that they're going to sell? Or do they want to say they're a founder on their Tinder profile and have the Shoreditch office, office and go to Soho House and say they're a founder? And it's like, I actually, be, it would be fascinating. When I talked to William Chase about this is if you were to rebrand the word founder to builder, builder's not sexy, but it probably is more builder. Yeah, 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 yeah. The amount of people who put their hand up in the, in the uni, university auditorium and be like, I want to be a founder. If you said, right, you've got to be a builder, I think a lot of hands would go down. And I think the whole thing of, of not being in London is fascinating. We're doing an event actually next week with co-op up in Manchester. Yeah. Because I was saying to, to the, the Kelly who's at the Apri is like, it's unfair that everything's pulled down to London and brands feel like they have to yeah, be yeah. in London. And then you, you talked about a, a lean team. What, what do you think? And again, I know a lot of this is all case specific, right? But what, what do you think are some of the, the absolute must have hires? Because I, th I think... What can happen, and John taught me this on the podcast, is oh, just because we've got more distribution doesn't mean we're getting more account managers. Yeah, like so I, I think what can yeah. happen is you get more distribution. Like, right, let's let's raise more. You know, not yeah. raise more, get more uh, people in to fund that. Or so, that. so I think I think what it fundamentally again, it'll be circumstantial and brand specific. But the crazy thing is, Dan, I can basically give you an example of a brand that's turning over forty million, who have paid, potentially got a team of sixty. But I've got another brand who's doing 40 million and there's eight of them in the office, right? Uh, it depends on the model you've got. Clearly, if you've got in-house production and manufacturing, by the nature of the beast, you can have more people, right? Sure. So, but, you know, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to, all you've got to think about every time is, right, I look at the way I look at it is that, so that I've got various different ways how I look at, I look at, you know, revenue and profit per head or per pound of um, employment income or whatever it is, you know, I look at all various different indicators and stuff like that, but it's quite simple for me, which is if you're making 
let's just say you're making a 30 or 40% gross margin, right? And long-term, you want to make 20, you know, 10% EBITDA as a minimum. Yeah. So let's just say 40% gross margin and 10% EBITDA. You've got 30 margin points to deploy between your marketing, between your people, and between your overheads, right? And you've got to think it in that way to say, right, how much money can I afford to spend on all, on all three of those? And how would I want to direct the money? Because it's already all, I could say to you, like, you can justify putting in eight or 10 head counts. But of that example there where you've got that 30% to play with, if that mm. represents 22% of the 30%, you've only got 8% left across your office, your overheads, and you're, and you're actually marketing, right? So I'm just a big believer is that every single role that you hire, that individual person on the sale, on the, if we're talking about sales role particularly, has to basically pay back. So if I'm, you know, let's just say I'm bringing somebody on a £30,000 salary, as a minimum, I would be saying that person there needs to generate as an absolute minimum £100,000 worth of revenue because obviously 30% of 100000 let's say 30% yeah, of the yeah, yeah. is 30, yeah. but, but I actually go one step further and say, actually, look, if I assume a 10% EBITDA model, right, yeah, that person actually needs to generate £300,000 worth of sale because if we're going to make 10% of the time, that's all flowed down to the bottom line, they then pay back at least. Now, that's only them breaking even on that role, right? So... What may or may not be a useful number for, for listeners is that, and the figures that I speak with my own my own portfolio guys about is that I normally talk contract, I keep it simple, where saying, look, if I'm a business that's like naught to 5 million, I think you need to have about 100K to, to 200K per head. If I'm like 5 to 15 million, I normally try and go, you know, normally go between a quarter of a million to half a million pounds revenue per head. Mm -hmm. And then anything that I think is like 15, 20 million above, you should be at 750,000 pounds to a million pounds per head. So for example, in my world, let's just say you've got 40 million turnover, I would try and get, I'd say you don't want no more team of 40 in there, which is a million pounds per head. Hmm. It's, a, it's quite a crude way of doing it, but it's just but, one way but, of but it. it's so valuable. So what you were talking about just then, which was super fascinating, is the, the revenue per head per, head, yeah. per, per does that stage. Make, does that make sense? Yeah, so that per stage. So talk, I'm relatively speaking around. So how do you work that out? Sorry, sorry. Crude. No, no, it's very crude, which is like, you know, so let's just say if you've got 5 million turnover mm -hmm. and you've got 10 people in the office, that's half a million per head, right? So right. So that's thousand per head, yeah? So that is just, again, it's just, it's a very crude way of way of looking at it. But that's what I've I've looked at because again, when I, typically when you look at the whole shape of the P&L and stuff, but like I said, you, you have to be careful here because certain businesses require, you know, different models and are more people intensive and stuff like that. Ultimately, what it comes down to is what's your business strategy and you build a team around the business strategy. But all I would say is that, and I, okay, if I put my investor hat on and just see what I'm, it scares the life out of me when I look at businesses which are still quite early but I see they've got a battalion of people already sitting in the office and they've built the team before the revenues come in because invariably in nine out of 10, that ends in tears because they've just got way too much cost base and the revenues don't quite materialize and then they've got a problem. Mm. And you'll be amazed how many people you see it. And, the, and obviously the difficult thing as well is that it's the, you know, there's, there's two issues as well, which is the, the emotional side of having to go through redundancy letting people go is big but also it can often have a very significant financial cost also having to you know, let a lot of people go as well again it kind of goes, we've talked a lot about ego and heart versus head in this conversation which is a fascinating kind of thing to dance between but i think it does go back and i wrote about this in one of my news letters like do you actually part i think some people want a big team because it's a bit like a swinging dick contest yep. at, at lunch trade you shows like, oh yeah my team's 15 people like, i mean oh, it's amazing. you can see it in the fame you can see different founders characters and you can see it right you yeah. can see you can I, can I can meet a character and i can almost say that they've got a battalion of people behind them and lo and behold somebody sells me yeah they've got 40 60 70 people there i'm like but you know it's i'm never going to criticize anybody I'm answering this in terms of the way I look at it. Yeah, sure. And the model, the business models that I like to get involved with or I've liked to have built or I now invest in today. Typically, I much prefer staying lean. And, you know, all I will say is that the majority of founders who've I've worked with, who've I've either curtailed how many people want to bring in or else take them on the journey about why that's the right thing to do. The lion's share of those and come back and God, thank God you told me that. That was one of the best bits of advice I've ever had because staying lean has just been brilliant because I can now spend loads more money on marketing. 
I don't feel as pressured because I've suddenly not got huge amount of overhead and people costs that I thought was going to be there and, you know, invariably. But equally, you don't want to under-resource a business if it's really growing quickly mm. and it's on a high growth trajectory because you might miss the boat. What are the most underrated hires you think that brands don't, that founders don't think about? Hmm, very good question. Um, so I think it depends on who the founder is, right? Um, but if you've got a founder who is very commercial or ops-led, not hiring an exceptional marketeer, I think, is quite often a big Achilles heel. You really want somebody who can build your brand to an incredible level from an early stage. Now, the good news is a lot of farm, a lot of sorry, sorry, farmers, a lot of founders are marketing and brand led. Mm. So let's take, for example, Pippa Murray, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Pippa Nut, which is, which is obviously one of mine. Great example there. But even she realizes because, you know, she shares the, the marketing and the brand and the innovation. Um, you know, she now, she now has a marketing director in, in you know, in, 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 in that business. Right. Um, so, you know, but I think the marketing role is an important one. Just, I'm sorry to interrupt. So at Islands, one of the brands I do some consultancy yeah. with, we've gone, or Wolf's gone through like a lot of marketing hires. And I think there's going to be quite a, a conflict of the founder versus the marketeer. How, again, back, a lot of yeah. this is balance. How do you, what do you think is a superstar marketeer? Like what are the credentials? Is it a... Well, what you're talking about there is founderitis, right? And the founder, founderitis, founderitis yeah, well, wait, they, can't, they can't let go of it, right? Yeah, yeah, Or yeah, else yeah, yeah. they're just, you know, so my, the fundamental for me is, there is no point in bringing somebody in unless you're going to give them an opportunity to, to kind of look after or run, or run the brand. So for example, if you look at that Pippa Nut situation, Jack, who's, she's an amazing person. She came in from Ella's Kitchen, Ella's Kitchen so she knows you know, what she's doing. Her and Pip complement themselves really, really well. There will be times where Pip you know, will just put her hand up and go as a you know, overall brand custodian. Actually, I'm not quite sure I agree with that. And actually, can we look at it a little different way? And I think she always reserves to do that. But I think it's about doing that right. But other businesses I've been in, I've, I've seen where the founder is literally spoon feeding the marketing director who's looked after brands, you know, a substantial size, yet will not let go of it. And it just doesn't work. And I, you know, I call that founder. I just, and it's not just in, I think the, 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 bottom, the bottom line is, is that if your founder is going to bring in somebody who's going to be your ops director, your, your finance director or head of finance, call them whatever you want, or you, you know, your kind of head of marketing, whatever, if you bring in a senior person there, give them, you know, give them the bandwidth to show what they're capable of and bring them in to just, you know, they're, they're obviously being paid normally pretty well. Let them demonstrate why you brought them in. I think the only caveat though is that what I do love and how I always love doing it, I, I, I love it nothing better than when, particularly in the earlier stages, some of my founders, founders have brought in some junior or middle level commercial marketing ops people. And over three, five years, they suddenly become the, ops commercial marketing director of the business because they've learned from that founder or learned through other mentorships and stuff like that and they're just growing with the business mm -hmm. and there's nothing better than seeing those sort of situations where rather than having to bring somebody in externally and plonk them at the top if somebody's come through the organization and literally you know mm -hmm. now, now now it's kind of uh, that kind of ops director or marketing director title that's great yeah i think i interviewed mark palmer quite a few times on this podcast yeah. and he talked about you don't always need a Harry Kane in terms of football. You can sometimes get put the youngsters on the pitch yeah. and let them get three yeah, or four yeah. youngsters on, say, 30k a year. Yeah. Get them working. They've got the hunger, the hustle. That can sometimes work well yeah. and then get, make them you know, go up in terms of using this fit, football analogy. That's basically how Harry Kane did it. In terms of the marketing role, um, I think brands can get confused between like sort of brand, founder and marketing because that, yeah, be, yeah. that can get all muddled. What, do you, what are you looking for? in terms of the marketing hire delivering? Is it driving the rate of sale? Is it, because again, it's, that's so- it, it's Well, so I think first of all, the scope of the role is completely dependent on what brand business you're looking at and also what the founder is about. So for example, you know, taking that Pip and Nut example, Pip retains a lot of the innovation because that's what her sweet spot is and that's what she loves to do. Interesting. Jax does a lot of the brand building and takes the core business and really develops that. Uh, very well and that that as far as i can concerned works 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 very well um so i think i think you've got to scope the role out based on what is right for you know the, the different brand or, or you know or or, or or you know or business um but i think you, you highlighted earlier i think bring in the right level of high though as well because it's just depends on when the, what stage the business is at but I, i'm what mark palmer says rings true with me because i always love bringing in junior middle people 
and letting them really cut the teeth and letting them run with it because I think that's part of being an entrepreneur, right? And just giving people opportunities to prove themselves. Mm. Want to go back to innocent? Um, it feels. I think that's. I reckon that's fifteen years ago for me now. It's quite a while, right? It's scary, isn't it? It's yeah, but innocent. I, I can't, the names. I think Emma Hill was an innocent. There's yeah, there's, she was. there's something in the water. Innocent, right? Oh, that yeah. is that is fucking. So excuse my language. Has created these entrepreneurs or founders or MDs who have just loads gone of on, them. I can, loads, I'm I can, trying to think, I can who, rattle off. You're going, you're, yeah, who are the? Yeah, so sorry, my, my brain's going a bit dark mush. But who are some of the founders? Oh, you've got. In, I mean, Hank Yan, who obviously did Tony's Chocoloni. Ben Greensmith, who's at Tony's, yeah. he's there. You know, I, I'm involved with Urban Legend, you know, the donut brand, which is uh, yep. the donut brand, which that's obviously Anthony Fletcher. Also, Peter Ford is there. Um, James, who's done Tails.com, James Davidson has done, you know, Tails.com. Uh, Emma Hill at Lucky Saint. Uh, danger of this is I'm going to miss somebody out. It's going to be really upset. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there are a few examples. Right? But, I mean, gosh, I'll give you another 20 people have done that. I think it's the business attracts that. The three boys attracted that sort of person, but they also put in a f phenomenal um, learning and development program, which basically helped people become more entrepreneurial and help people absolutely excel in their role. Out of any business I've been at, the training and development you got at Innocent was unbelievable. But also what was great about it, we obviously did use a, a lot of, ex of external stuff. So Karen, Karen Callahan, who now runs her own business today, who is an exceptional um, kind of strategic level, um, kind of HR people and, and, and kind of culture development person. You know, she helped orchestrate all of this, but, you know, what was the, one of the best things about Innocent was, and it was partly cost, but also it wasn't just cost, it's because, we, you know, Innocent wanted to do things a certain way. 60, 70% of the training programs were developed internally and delivered by people internally. Mm. So as well as doing your job, so for example, I used to take the negotiations training and I wasn't just, it wasn't just the sales team, Guess what? Procurement team, the guys in finance and stuff, because these guys speak with people the whole time. So, you know, other companies are only training, train up sales team in negotiation. You're like, well, hang on a minute. Your ops team are spending millions on fruit every year. Yeah, you know, true. all this, yeah, and just yeah, the, you yeah. know, thinking like that. And it's, um, yeah, Innocent was a great ground for just creating that entrepreneurial kind of spirit and just, you know, that, that endeavor. And yeah, for me, for a lot of people, Innocent was a platform that is a stepping stone for people to go and do their own thing. Mm. A lot of people have. And, what, what's what's also a massive um, positive indictment, sorry, not indictment, a positive reflection of the business is there are so many people who I worked with 15 years ago still in there. So, you know, it's absolutely crazy. And, you know, the COO who was FD at the time, James, he's a, James Davenport, is a great guy. Mm. He's still there 15 years later. Mm. Well, I know we talked about it previously, but you were te teaching the no negotiation course on or training at yeah, black black my way through it yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. don't worry yeah. what would you say again and this is i asked this you know um i'm such a people pleaser that when it comes to negotiating i just want i kind of want the deal done do you know what i mean and it's, it's something i'm having to work chip away at but what, what would you say are your kind of big principles i know we talked kind of talked about it earlier of negotiation that you think and this is i think everything in life is negotiation this yeah. isn't just about selling your brand to a supermarket this is about getting off a parking ticket. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like, it could be anything. I've yeah. Had a I mean, there's loads, of, there's loads of principles, right? The, the most important thing for me is ask questions to understand what the other side truly wants. That's the most important thing. Because if it, unless, and, and it's the quality of those questions, you want to ask the questions that get you to the bottom understanding about what that person really needs. Because only then do you truly know how you can then fulfill those needs and try and then secure your negotiation. And I think the other really important thing as well is just be really clear about the nature of the negotiation because it's like if you're speaking with the buyer at Boots or you're buying a car from a local dealership, you've got two different things going on there, right? The dealership, you can afford to walk away, right? And that's it. And it's, it's more transactional whether you like it or not. Mm. You know, he'll try and sell you every extra possible on the car or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll, yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll end up with this ridiculous spoiler that you don't, can't believe it's cost that much, but you've got to have it. But fundamentally with boots, you're probably, most startup businesses and brands probably have to have three to five success. There's three to five failures on negotiations before they then get in there, right? Or else three to five pitches before they can get, get, then get in there. 
And you just got to do everything you can because the negotiation doesn't isn't necessarily just trying to agree a listing or price. It's about how you approach it. And you know, I even remember one, and the guys at Innocent remember this. We we had a buyer at Boots, and she was ferocious, and she just hated us, and we weren't sure why. On the end, we just sent her some flowers and just said, "Look, we think we've upset you. We don't know why or how, but I'm really sorry." Within an hour, oh, sorry, I don't really. Can you come in tomorrow? I didn't want to come across in that way, and it just changed the dynamic of the relationship straight mm-hmm. away, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, knowing that other side of the fence, but the other thing as well is when you are in a negotiation, it's just being really clear on your parameters and what your true is, what you call like your, you know, what is that walk away? And I gave you an example earlier about the gross margins and stuff like that. You know, don't be the person in the meeting who just gets overexcited and I've just got the Tesco's listing, but actually I wasn't prepared or I hadn't really, really understood the numbers. <laughs> Shit, we're only making 10% on that. You know that, let's just say, as I said to you before, 20% gross margin minimum and that could equate to a £5.20 case price if that buyer says it's got to be five quid or nothing be prepared to walk away because mm. it's not the five twenty walk away position you're trying to get away five fifty, but you know that's not going to happen Five twenty is your walk away but the buyer says five don't do it there's a lot a lot of this is kind of this and again this dichotomy of, of like the heart and the head and the ego. Yeah. And, the, and I think you're so right. And to be honest, if someone, if I was sat up across the Tesco's bar and they're like, right, well, I'd, I probably would just do it. Cause yeah. <laughs> maybe, you know, um, but it, but it, it's what you're saying, Giles is, is amazing in terms of the pricing of, do you think brands should say they're, I mean, let's just say for, for argument's sake, yeah. they're, they're the cost price they want to sell in in at is one fifty because I've had it before where you, you sell in at the price yeah. and then they whistle you down back to the GM and then, you get so blinded by the listing, like you want the listing, so you just kind of do it. I've done this. And then you actually go in, you're like, right, I've got to promote, so I'm lost making on promotion. Do you, do you think brands should give themselves a bit of wiggle room or how do, how do you think? Well, I know that's, again... The, the scenario you just played there, the biggest advice I give is don't commit in that meeting. I would be saying, right, tell me what you can give me. So be really clear to say, right, so look, we've established what your needs are. I think I can fill these needs through here. Because it's like somebody saying, oh, they're, they're going to give me three lines, um, but they want 45% margin. I'm like, right, okay, what does that three lines mean? Where is it being merchandised? More importantly, how many stores is it going in? Because if it's three lines in 200 stores versus three lines in 1,000 stores, that's going to, mm. should, should, should result in a different case price, right? So get all the information together before you start, because the classic is, let's just say you've got, you know, scenario you just played out there, or whatever. So somebody says, all right, three lines, yeah, going to go in. Um, we've got 500 stores and it's 45% margin. I need a five pound case price. Yeah, okay, we'll agree to that. Brilliant, cool. Just so you know as well, I need six promotions. Each of those has got a 3,000 pound shelf ticket fee. Oh, and also um, I need a 20,000 pound marketing. Oh no, hang on, sorry. I can't, well, the, the, all our money's in the five pound case price. I can't give you any, well, no, sorry, I need that as well now. So it's really important get all the information and get and know exactly what everything that, that person wants first and then go back. Never been, you know, very unusual, but some, you know, very few buyers will make you say in a room, right, I need an answer here and now. It's more a case of, you know, going back, get all the facts, clarify what you need to know, get the commitments as you can, uh, that you can from the buyer and then put an all inclusive. And it's that classic, you know, if you, if, you know, I always start with, if you can give me X, Y, and Z, then I can give you this, yeah? Start with what you need first and then tell them what you can give. Because if you start with, I can give you this, great, that's fine. Oh, no, no, I haven't told you what I need first. Do you know what I mean? There's just some subtleties in how you do it. What are the other subtlety, subtleties or nuances, I think, in negotiation? Because I, lo- I love going down that nuance yeah. path. Uh, what other subtleties would I say? I mean, look, I mean, how you, beha- how you act and how you behave is important, right? I mean, there's everything from hostile, which I've, we've all been before, <laughs> mm. um, you know, I've also, you had the classics where you've had the kind of bad cop, good cop combo coming in. You had, had some, I met, I had a, such a funny couple at Asda when we used to deal with the fr- fresh produce. We had the buyer and the senior buyer and those two were just comedy going in and seeing those guys. <laughs> and how, how they, it was like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> so funny how, how that used to work. Um, what other subtleties would I, would I say? Um, I don't know. I think the biggest thing for me is just think about longevity relationships. Oh, yeah, I love uh, that. Longevity relationships is an important thing because... And yeah, and, and, and the, probably one of the biggest messages I give everybody is because I I often hear, and I get quite ang- angry about it, um, is that I'll hear people like slagging off certain retailers or customers going, oh, nightmare to deal with, got so hard, they don't understand how different. I said, the the real reality is in 
virtually all of these FMCG startups I know, most of those guys wouldn't have a business without a supermarket, right? And those guys, supermarkets, I know they're difficult to deal with, but also they've got a job to do, right? And so those supermarkets aren't doing that well either. So they are under a huge amount of pressure under the pump, yeah? But don't be so derogatory and rude about them or the buyers because they're trying to do the best job for their own company. But also without them, most of you wouldn't have a business. So I get quite, when I when people end up, you know, making kind of strong statements, you know, about about supermarkets or against the buyers or not just supermarkets, but the national retailers, how they behave, I think you've got to be a bit careful because a lot of people are indebted to them. In terms of innocent, you talked about, on our last podcast, John Wright would make any FTSE 100 CEO <laughs> look average, which yeah, I thought was yeah, yeah. Was, br- was brilliant. Um, and maybe this goes back into the innocent water. And we t- yeah. what you've said about the negotiation, by the way, was, is amazing. Will help so many people. What, what, what was different about um, John Wright? Like, why, why, is, why would he make every FTSE 100 CEO look average? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I also had the pleasure of sitting next to John as well. Right. Oh my god, that was intimidating. <laughs> how big? Were, how big was the the team at this point? Or the- uh, we were. Gosh, well, that's another story. We went way too big, way too big. Innocent went. Let, let, okay, we get, we, we, I've got to go down that path. So, and then we can come back to John. But so, why did it go too big? What because was- you know, I did. I did the same with Vita Coco. We we got ahead of ourselves. Like you know, we thought we could take on the world. We thought we could grow to this size and stuff like that. Still, fully successful. But like any brand does business, you had a correction period. And the trouble is, when you've already put all the overheads and the cost in and have a correction period suddenly we'll start to wobble. So, and also as a culture, because you're such a want to please, want to do more, 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 you start justifying jobs. There's then more meetings in the diary and stuff like that. And one of the best things, you, one of the best things of advice I can give, I can give anybody is that anybody feels that business is starting to get out of control or, or like look, look around and suddenly there's like, where the hell's everybody come from? I just go, stop. I literally cancel every meeting, every diary and I start again and say, right, boom, right. Stop your meetings, right. What meetings do we need to have as a business, both as a senior leadership team, within your teams and stuff, and start again? Because you know what it's like? People just pile oh layer upon layer. Yeah, Nothing yeah, yeah. drops out the funnel at the bottom, yeah. yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think that's that's the first that's the first thing to say. But going back to your specific question around what made John different was, well, a few things. John, Richard and Adam complemented themselves incredibly well. John, operationally and strategically, so bright. All three were strategically very bright. Richard was a very good marketeer, Adam very commercial. So they knew their own roles and their own and, and what they did and they complemented each other really well. The beauty of someone like John was that John was a phenomenal listener, an even better question asker. Annoyingly, he already knew what the answer was, but he would still ask other people, right? But the, the biggest beauty with John was that he had the ability to make complex issues, questions, dilemmas. He able to break them down and make everything so simple. That is the biggest trait. We could have the most complex problem that could have done with somebody who knew how to do quadratic equations or algorithms <laughs> beyond belief. And John would just cut through it all. Yeah, an and example of that. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's just, it's everything. Is, it's this, you know, the best, one of the best things was, it's, it's also about how, it's how he talked and how he communicated. And like, we would talk about the issues we got. And let's just take, for example, we, we, had, we had issues in our, what we call our pricing elasticity. So we had real issues trying to work out what was the right price for our one liter smoothies to be at, both at full price and on promotion that got us to an average price that meant we could hit the numbers we needed to hit while still hit the profit and stuff like that. And the rest of us were creating these really complicated ways of looking at it and complicated. John would just walk in and don't get me wrong i couldn't even do the equations he's done on the spreadsheet seat behind it you just drop in a one pager kind of just talk you through that and you'd be like that's really annoying because that's exactly what we need to do and that's exactly what i meant but that's just such a better way of saying it <clears throat> and that just that clarity of communication and that simplicity is the biggest trait in leadership you can keep you know i think everybody including me you know every so often over complicate business keep business simple the more simple it is the easier people understand it the easier it is to engage with the consumers the easier it is that people know their roles and stuff like that mm-hmm. and that that was john's ability he was highly strategic but also just so clear and so simple of what he did the i talked about this with 
uh, Straker and Toby this morning and we were talking about, and this is a common theme across a lot of guests I've interviewed, is this ability to find simplicity and complexity. And actually what we were saying is simple is work. Simple is hard. You know, the, the whole thing is, oh, oh, it'll be easy. It's so simple. It's easy, yeah. mate. It's so easy. It's simple. Like, do you know what I mean? No, it's simple and reduction is, is one of the hardest yeah. things you can do. Can you teach that, do you think? Or how, how would you teach that with some of your brands to, to reduce complexity down? Hi guys, super, super quick one. So, so excited. Look, for years I've been badgering on about Hungry the podcast. You're probably bored to death. Thanks for putting up with me. But Hungry is also an agency. And we look after one amazing brand called Islands Chocolate. We've had a great time over the year. We've won listings at a load of wholesalers. We've won Milk and More. We've got our first grocery listing coming very soon, which is very, very sick. But what I'm thrilled to announce is Hungry is merging with HC Consulting. Um, my boy Harry Clark and his wonderful team, he's an absolute G. They do brand strategy, new business, business and account management. But why I really love working with Harry and why we've got on so well over the last couple of months is Harry was actually the founder of uh, the boozy isolated brand Pops. So he's been in the trenches, he's grafted his face off, he's had the sleepless nights, he's had the turmoil, he's had the triumph, he knows what it is to be a founder, he is a founder. And he's got a proven track record in grocery and out of home. Holy moly dips, the gut stuff, Savile drinks, Remio gelato. So if you're a brand and you're, you're stuck, you're looking for like new business help, you're looking to scale, drop us a message, we'd love to chat. Thank you so much, back to the old episode. Uh, I've done, we've done it loads and it's it's been quite an emotional journey right it's quite a few businesses I've gone in and I said look I want to give you some advice but the thing is I come from a place where a lot of what I'm trying to articulate and try and educate is based on the mistakes I made myself right it's not because I'm a know-it-all and I'm you know I, I'm, I'm brighter than other people I've learned as much the hard way as 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 as, 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 as I have done from kind of getting it right first time as well and you know there's a number of businesses I've gone in and, you know, we've talked about keeping the business lean. We've talked about, you know, how we work with certain retailers, what margin uh, margins are willing to, to work with and stuff like that. And, you know, also you know, it's, it's just amazing because it, I think the other big thing as well is that if you're in it day in, day out and you're under the pump day in, day out, you just lose so much ability to kind of step back and see what's going on in the bigger picture. I'm now very lucky these days where, and it, maybe it's a skill or trait I've got, but one of the things that people continually tell me is I can sit in a room with somebody for an hour and I've got everything, and I know everything, and I'll just come out with what I think. And people are like, how the frig are you? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're not in a business, if you, if you work, uh, if I work on or with a business, it's much different than working in a business, right? Right, yeah, yeah, And yeah, I can yeah. see these things. And it's just, that's the other thing as well, is that particularly for seeing leadership team, you've got to sometimes plot them out and just almost like, hose them down and just give them smelling salts to say right stop right i'm going to put you on the side of the road because at the moment you're in the traffic going up and down up and down i'm going to sit you on the side of the road wait until everything calms down right now let's look at that busy road that that's where you were and stuff like that right what do we think okay how do we how do we how do we bring it back down again how do we make life easier doing a hundred things but not doing them as well as we could do what five things let's, let's talk about doing five things and doing five things very well and that's one of the things that all Innocent always pre preached about was that rather than everybody trying to conquer everything, doing a few things exceptionally well was always going to be the best strategy for the business. And it always was. I wanted to go now. I was listening to a po high performance podcast with Gordon Ramsay. And let's, and he was talking about kind of one star to three star rest, Michelin restaurants. And the, the, uh, Jake, the presenter, asked a really good question. He was like, what's the difference between a one star restaurant and a three star? Because three stars so, so hard. And Gordon said, chefs, when they get to that three star level, have to go into it. To, they have to find a gear that they, they didn't even know was possible. Yep. I kind of think that's a bit like brands. So brands, if you were to say like one star is that five million point, and I know you kind of, everyone I've interviewed said, get into the one million's fucking hard, then to five once you've got the kind of retailers. But to kick on, to go to that three star, yeah. where you're, where you're in, you know, selling Bear to Lotus or seeing Innocent Grow or, or Vice Coco, what are the extra gears the founder has to find to, to kick on? Because yeah. so many brands get stuck at that point. Yeah. Again... I think it'll be very much slightly different across different businesses. Yeah. But in the main, I think the founder who surrounds himself with exceptional people and with a complementary senior leadership team, that is one of the key things and not having founderitis because typically 
bringing in expertise to complement you is how you unlock that next stage of growth. I think the other big thing is you've got to really understand about, I'm trying to avoid using horrible marketing terms, but for me, it's all about how your brand stands out and how actually, even though you're a small brand, how your brand punches above its weight and how does it, you know, how do you create those brand moments? Suddenly you get that kind of pester power. You get everybody's talking about you because, you know, there's some amazing examples of brands where they actually haven't spent a lot of money, but, you know, everybody's talking about them, right? And it's, you know, it's incredible. And we, and we had that, we had that with Bear, right? And, you know, admittedly, one of the big assets was, was, was the cards and the cards did a big job for us on that. But what did the cards do? Sorry. So we did a whole lot of collector cards and they're all fat cards. Fact as in, so basically all different things. So you might have like, you know, about the countries of the world, or you might have, uh, you know, mythical uh, creatures or creators like that. So we did, I don't know how many they've got today. They probably had about 70, 100 different collector cards, as in like editions of collector cards where there's like, 50, 70 characters or do it, but they were always informative and educational. And of course, kids wanted to collect them all and they were trying to get them all. And importantly also, if people were missing card four, nine and 12, they didn't have to spend a fortune. They just write into us and we do swaps and stuff. And we swap them in with the ones so that I wanted, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but you've got to really look at your product and say, what is the difference and what is the USP that st- takes you on to that next level? And what makes you exceptional versus everybody else that's out there? Um, and I think, you know, we worked very hard at that at uh, Vita Coco because it was all about owning the coconut and being, we want to be seen as the, the experts in coconut because that's what we knew because standards, because particularly when you've got, you know, Innocent came into coconut water, um, you know, Tropicana, Naked, which is obviously PepsiCo brands, they came into, into coconut water and stuff like that. But we fundamentally knew that we were, all we ever obsessed and worried and loved was coconut and therefore consumers actually bought into that as well. They, they kind of said, you, you guys are the go-to coconut guys. And we spent a lot of time marketing that and doing mm. that. And, you know, things like beach executions, big mangroves, the guys have just had down in London all summer, not obviously at the moment, the current weather, but down there, they've just had the coconut grove, which, you know, great bar and stuff, which is literally, you know, real cool cocktail bar that could have been, you know, off, 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 off the beaches in, you know, in Brazil and stuff like that. Um, so creating those brand moments and touch points, I think is, I think is, you know, you know, really important. But I think as a founder, you've got to set the vision and you've got to be really clear about where the business wants to go, but also you've got to be prepared to roll your sleeves up and do it. And I always remember it, you know, Bear and Bite Coco, and some of the guys might argue otherwise, but, you know, it's, if you think, you know, if you think you've got to be at various different consumer or trade festivals, weekend, weekend out, weekend out, as a founder, be there. You got to be there. You got to muck in. You got to you got to play your part and stuff like that. If you really want to go to the brand and business to the next level, you got to show that you're committed to that next level and you're still prepared to put the hard work in yourself. Because I, I have been in quite a few businesses where I've seen some founders step back and say, right, "I've got a certain stage. Let's let everybody else do the hard work." I think as a founder, you've got to double down and go even harder because if you don't set the pace and the expectations, you can't expect people to follow you. Mm. This is what the, the honest guy said literally in the, in the room over there the other last week it's like as the founder you set the tone yeah and i think it's like almost the, the pacemaker um you're super driven giles and as you said this is you look like the, the you said to alex a food and drink lifer you've, you've got so much drive you do these triathlons um what gordon ramsay was saying is is he was saying that under underneath his success and his um is, is an underlying jeopardy and he says for uh the velocity of jeopardy and it's almost like that 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 chip on your shoulder for, for me you know growing up was a bit of a porker always like always i don't know i was, I was, always, a, por- I was a porker yeah too, i always right. always <laughs> felt um slightly on the periphery of things was never predicted good grades got good growth i've always had this kind of fuck you syndrome yeah. um went to bournemouth uni i was like i i should have got into Russell Group University, left that, went to Manchester. So I've always had this like, and I've, I've got it now, right? And it's propelling me, it's my, it's my velocity. But what, what would you say is, is your, your jeopardy that's pre- given you this, this huge amount of drive? Hmm. I don't know, it's, it's what would I say? I mean, yeah, if I go back to home life, we are brought up very strictly, my sister and I. So Where were you brought up? Uh, so, but I just brought up in Leicestershire, but we just brought, okay, up, yeah, yeah. brought up very strictly um, and also with very high expectations. So that's probably a little bit of the driver 
long, you know, a lot, that's the long term drive. I guess it's, um, I'm just a big believer in like, kind of, I hate saying this, like trying to be the best version of yourself or, try, or, or like self improvement. And just for me, which is, you want to go to bed every night and be proud of what you've done the day. You want to wake up the next day and go, right, how do I, you know, it's that kind of 1% better each day sort of thing. And I think, I don't know, I just, I just don't accept averageness. And also, I, you know, look at what I do in food and drink. It annoys me that some of the big, you know, look at the health agenda or some of the big, you know, environmental agendas. It annoys me that a lot of the big companies just have been dragging their heels for the last few years. Something's got to be done about it because, you know, if we don't, the planet's screwed, the health and wealth, the health of the nation's screwed. And it's just, you know, somebody's got to do something about it. And it, that buck starts with you. And that's, that's a big thing for me. And then I think probably later in life, right? I want to talk about later in life. I'm talking about the last probably 15 years. So I've got a nine or 12 year old. It's also about, you know, it's what you, it's how you want your kids to see you and how, you know, it's, that's the biggest driver I have today now is my, you know, my two boys. I want my two boys to kind of see that, you know, daddy works hard, you know, daddy, you know, is always trying to do the best and try without necessarily being patronizing or else, you know, give them a whole load of cliches that just the actions and what they see me doing is enough to inspire them to do themselves. And, you know, I can see, and to be fair, I can see that rubbing off a little bit on, on, on how they behave and what they do now already, which, which is great. And my, my eldest is just in the process of setting up a t-shirt business, his own little branded business and stuff Amazing. like that, yeah, 12 yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. And, um, you know, the big thing for me, and I just, it's just all of this though, is you can only do this if you find what you're passionate about and what you enjoy doing. And that's the big thing, both within career and, and outside of, outside of career, only do something you thoroughly enjoy because what's the point otherwise. And I have to be careful because I, I help out quite a few local schools and universities and go and do lectures to like international business students and stuff like that. And I have to be a bit careful sometimes, but I hate it when I see somebody who's phenomenally entrepreneurial. And I told them, well, what do you want to do? And I can see that the, they'll just sink a little bit. Oh, I'm going to probably be a lawyer or accountant or something like that. And by the way, there is nothing wrong with being a lawyer or accountant. Why are you going to do that? It's because what, that's what my mum and dad want me to do. <sighs> and I look at that person and I'm like, and sometimes I'll go, is that what you want to do? No. And I'll just go, not for me to say it, but so I have to be careful sometimes. You know what I mean? the question but that's the thing as well. Just, you know, just find something that inspires you and just you're really you know you're really really passionate about and if it's just it works for different people but mine mine funny enough mine's not a mine's not a competitiveness or a got to be the best or anything like that it's just for me about trying to be the best version of yourself and just trying to do the best possible job because i, I don't know to set standards and to be fair you know parents set high standards and stuff like that I, I just, you said that you said the, the upbringing was strict like well just very yeah very strict as in like you know no, it's, it's all relative, right? So let's be really clear. It's all relative. But, you know, never allowed to sit around at home. You know, any, as soon as I was of an age, I worked every single holiday. Um, what did your parents do? Um, my dad was in textiles, owned his own business oh, nice. in Leicester. And I used to work a little bit for him. And, you know, that was a tough industry. You know, we picked up loads of bad debts. We'd have to break into factories to try and nick our, get get our, our like the, the, the material, like the yarn or the cotton that he'd sold. We'd have to break into factories to get that back because mm -hmm. otherwise these guys weren't going to, um, these are going bust, but they set up in the old day. You just set up for you basically buy all the assets of the business for a pound and set up the next day. We're like, no, no. So we go in there and get get back what was ours. So it was a pretty, it was amazing to do that. But um, it was just just strict, but also just like, you know there were quite high expectations. But it's not. I don't think that's been the main driver for me. The main driver for me is just within myself. Is just that I don't know. That I feel there's a if I don't push myself or do the best job that I think I can do then there's a void in me and that's what drives me is I just want to try and do the best possible job. And Do you have a strong inner critic? Um, I used to have quite a big monkey or chip, but um, I've just read a book recently. Called? Uh, you probably know. Have you seen the one about not to give a fuck, that book? To start up and getting yeah. a fuck. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've read it, but it hasn't exactly seeped into yeah, my soul see, now just I, yet. I have <laughs> on that because, you know, anyway, you can't be everything to everybody, right? Mm. And there was a... There was a there was a time earlier in my career where it used to really worry me what other people thought, and it, I won't say people pleaser, but just you know there was a, there was a time where I was intimidated by other people, and I had to try and you know prove myself. But that disappeared quite a while, a while ago, and I don't I don't give a crap today. And you know 
it's like the job I do today. I'm, I'm primarily an investor, but actually most investors invest to make money. I invest because I enjoy doing what I'm doing. And there's a massive difference. And some people go, oh, of course you say that. That's genuinely the truth. Mm. I, I, I do what I do because I love doing it. I, it doesn't bother me because if I was about money, I'd be doing another bear or Vita Coco or something like that. I'd be flipping and doing that again and going full tilt. And that's not what drives me. Mm. How did you temper and mellow out the inner critic? Because mine's a little mendacious thug that can kind of bounce yeah. and bounce around. Like, you know, I'll do a podcast sometimes. I'll be like, I'll listen back to, back to it because I've got to edit it. Yeah. I'll be like, that was shit. That was, you need, you should have done that. Like, and it's, and then I was speaking to my therapist about it. He's like, mate, just, just a bit like what you were saying about almost being too in it. It's like, step back, like, zoom out. Well, but, but I think it's so, it's, but, it's needed for drive to a point. But, what you've got to do is you've got to understand whether it's healthy and when it's not healthy, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. the big thing. But the key thing for me, and this is the same with absolutely all of us, is that we have all have learned behaviors, right? And, you know, I used to, you know, as, as a kid, actually, I was, I, as a kid and also in, in my early 20s, I used, to have, I used to have panic attacks, right? Because, and people who know me today are like, yeah, I would not assume up. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you no, seem no, super I, you know, I used to be quite, used to be quite anxious. And that's probably about expectations from other people and stuff like that. But, it's it's bloody difficult to do it, but you can rewire because at the end of the day you weren't like that at some point. Doesn't matter whether you were still in the crib or whenever it was, right? So there's a learned behaviour that's changed or, or developed the way you are. There is always a way to rewire a learned behaviour. It might take a long time, but you just got to keep working at it, working at it, working at it, working. And it doesn't matter whether it's anxiety or it's somebody who's um, you know, um, high energy or whether it's somebody who's depressed or whatever it is, there's all these things. And it, it, obviously, you know, there's people spending thousands and thousands of pounds on, on, on these sort of things. But for me, it's just, I'm just very content with where I'm at, who I am. Hmm. And also I know what's very important to me. So for example, right now, Penny and the kids, and I, you know, it's, it's a horrible thing to say, but Penny and the kids are, that's, that's where everything stops now. I've got my sister, I've got my, me and my dad's still around, other bits and pieces that don't mean are very important. But right now, no matter what happens, Penny and the kids, that's where everything starts with that first and everything else fits around that, mm. yeah? And I think you've got, to, you've got to reset your rules and stuff like that. And there's also been some life, lifestyle thing changes. So like a lot of people, you know, I've got to, I bet you've had so many people on the podcast talk about this. You know, I used to drink a lot, right? And actually in my early 20s, that's what I think was the main driver of the panic attacks because I, I get really bad anxiety from alcohol. Um, so I'm two months sober now. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, when we did our first one, our first interview, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so anxious and nervous. I was vaping beforehand, <laughs> like p- p- yeah, yeah. that week, pounding, pounding the fucking pints. After that, oh, that went to that booze in Islington where you've probably yeah. just been on today. Just ding, 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 ding. And, just, and then now, two months down yeah, the line, yeah. I'm just like, whoa. Yeah. So I, I, I'm not wrong to say I'm teetotal, but I don't drink hardly at all now because unfortunately, whatever it is, the chemicals or whatever's in it, it just makes me anxious um and i do you know annoyingly i had a 50th at the weekend and i had far too much gin and i felt dreadful sunday monday and that's enough to make me realize why i don't drink much these days mm. um and i much i much prefer the person i am today as well like, i've changed significantly since you know the days when i used to be a heavy drinker and stuff like that and you know it's just it's part and parcel of it but also i'm not all these are done as subtle changes or else just things I just embrace because you know some people can give themselves a real hard time or I've got to really change this or I'll do this it's like no no I think if you try and do if you try, yeah all these things for me is if you if, if you live in a world of extremes it's a fucking impossible place to do the whole thing for me is life in the middle is a lot easier whatever nuances whatever traits you've got whatever you know situation you try to do right just try and nudge mm. from the extremes into the middle because there's a lot more comfortable in the middle and, I, and don't get me wrong it is very difficult for a lot of people to do it, but everybody, something has changed or something's developed in, in everybody that they're wired or they're a certain way and you can rewire yourself. Just take What did you have to rewire? Was it, was it the anxiety? Uh, yeah, it was, it was, what I rewired was, I rewired them things. It's anxiety. It's also the rules I was setting myself. The, the rules I was setting myself. Which yeah, were they? I had to do this. I've got to be like this. I've got to do this. Uh, I've, got to, yeah. I've got to be everything to everybody. Like, you know, in the old day, I was trying to please everybody. Right now, I let people down every day and I don't care. I know what's important to me. I know what's important to the people around me and that's all that matter, mm. matters, right? Um, and I think it's just resetting the rules for yourself and the, and the rules of engagement. 
And it's, you know, the, the scary thing is, Dan, is most people, you know, don't do this until far too late in their life. And it's like, you know, I, 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 started, I started really challenging the way I was kind of conducting my life and how I was thinking and stuff in my 30s. And, you know, made a massive difference to me. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I still have days where I'm anxious and bits and pieces and stuff like that. And that's just part and parcel, you know, and going with it. But I think it's um, just being able to just extract yourself out of the, the melee and just be able to say, right, what for me, and obviously in my case with my family, with Penny, my, Oscar and Arthur, my two boys, how do I make put everything together that it's the best dynamic mm. for us as a family? Arthur's my granddad's name. The... Um what what's the advice you'd give Oscar and Arthur? Uh, How old are they? Because I saw, I think I saw. Nine and in twelve, yes, yeah, so nine and twelve. Um, do you know? I'm trying not to be overbearing, or you know, the parent who tries to overly coach. Um, for my, what the boys and me, it's just really simple. Which is, so I'm I'm more important on, on life skills or on academia. I I don't. The boys don't need. To, you know, I think. I'm not very bright, if I'm honest with you. I'm streetwise and I'm commercial. And I'm, Oscar's, my eldest is really like me, actually. He's quite smart, but he's not going to be really academic. Um, so I've just said to them, look, you know, life skills will trump academia day in, day out. So think about what life skills are. Like, you know, want you to be confident, but importantly, you know, never cocky and never, mm. you know, never overconfident. You know, be very charismatic, be very humble in bits and pieces. Um you know, we talk also, I mean, you've got to be careful, they're nine and 12, right? <laughs> but you know, lens. but it's scary, right? Because some parents are literally already at the kind of- the school gates. <laughs> I just, you know, I said that I want, you know, be happy, do the best at everything you do. Um, um, you know, whenever you do, do stuff that makes you passionate. If you mm -hmm. don't, if you don't enjoy doing something, come and talk to me about it. And you know, if it's right, you don't, if you stop doing it, mm -hmm. don't do it. And you know, I've had that conversation with my eldest about a couple of, couple of sports he doesn't like doing. I'm like, well, don't do them. Mm -hmm. Oh, but da yeah, but daddy, you'll be upset if I don't do that. No, you won't. No, I won't. Mm. Well, you do what you enjoy doing. Um, there's a quote by Oscar Wilde called, called Everything Popular is Wrong, which I love. What do, what do you think is common advice given to food and drink founders that's popular but wrong? You need loads of money to be successful. Or you need to raise loads of money to be successful. Still think that's wrong. What else? That's a very deep question, that, Dan. That's, that's one I normally say, I'd have to sleep on that, I'd think about that, which I think if there's anything else on top of my head that I can think, which is... I think another one is, you know, build the scale. Build the scale first and then worry about the margins later. I think I've touched on that earlier today. Mm. I don't think that's right. I think a lot of people still say that, which is, I don't worry, you'll get your margins back with scale. It doesn't always work that way. You know, having a viable business from day one is, is paramount to me. Um, and then one which you'll laugh at, I'm sure, which is, yeah, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to set this business up and sell it in three to five years. Never happens. Double whatever your time expectations are. Mm. If you get an exit in six to 12 years, you're bloody lucky. That's one thing I've, well, I, I, that was one of the slides in my talk at Bread and Jam is, is, founders who again it's cool to look at silicon valley yeah and in silicon valley you have these unicorn brands that are, you know like the, the airbnbs the the billion dollar brands we we put those on pedestals and it's like that's the unicorn and the the, the, the point is uh, be a donkey not a unicorn and it's actually yeah. in food and drink it's a way longer process because the actual for, for, a, for a tech brand for it to generate users like it can be 10 minutes yeah for food and drink, if someone's got to literally go to a store with yeah. all the supply chain, and I think that's such a good, that's one thing I've learned is from every guest, and that's one of the big things that's changed in my my perspective is, uh, is it's a long game. Yeah. Um, also, it never, get, it never gets easier as well, right? A lot of people will say, it's really tough at the start, but don't worry, it gets easier. It doesn't. Just the, the nature of the challenges just change. Mm. It's mm. always tough. And the the problem is, with you know, the, particularly when you're an individual founder, the buck always stops with you, right? That's a tough bit as well. Mm. It's unrelenting sometimes. But some people revel in it. And I, you know, I've reveled in it. And then the various different roles that I've played. What's, um, what's one belief you've, that's radically, you, that you had that's radically changed in the last five years, over the last five years? Personal belief or business belief? Let's do both. I 
I think the, the biggest personal belief, I mean, it's actually probably a work one as well, which is, uh, you know, again, it's a bit cliche, but working smarter rather than working hard is a lot better for you and everybody around you. Yeah, you know, I used to work, tw- I mean, getting, when we got Bear and Vitecoker off the, off, off the ground, yeah, I'd have, I mean, it's difficult to explain it, but, you know, six and a half, seven days a week. What were the hours day to day? Oh, frightening. I know, I'll tell you, I was, I was operating on five hours sleep and working like 18, 19 hour days. You know what I mean? It's just like, and, you know, it was, that was, it, it was tough, but I also realized that, because back then I was about trying to tick every single box and just trying to keep everybody happy and deliver every single bit I was supposed to be living. Whereas today, if I, if I set those businesses up today, I'd strip out 70% of what I was doing because I know that 30% will only make or break the business. And that's what, what 70% would you strip out? Well, it's just loads of things, which is just, you can't, if you're not careful, particularly in what we do in founders, you can be a bit obsessive or perfectionist. Yeah. Be perfectionist in the 30% that the things you have to get absolutely right, but let other stuff be a bit rough around the edges. So, you know, for example, I might be pulling a deck together. It doesn't have to be freaking perfect. Just you know, just get it out there. It's fine. Whereas in the old day, I'd obsess about it. it got to be absolutely brilliant. I'd be there spending hours getting the right image off, you know, out off the internet and bits and pieces and stuff like that. And don't get me wrong, it's still set yourself high standards, but you can't apply it to everything. You've got to just really do, do it more cleverly. Mm-hmm. I think that that probably in, 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 in personal and business life, that's probably the biggest thing. That is definitely in fact the biggest thing for me, which is just about being smarter and just focus on what truly makes a difference and let, let other stuff, go and stroke often let other people down and you know i have it i've heard the whole time mm. i mean i've got it's like this week i've just come back a holiday and there's people chasing me to do give them intros and bits and pieces like that and they're like oh, God, you're really difficult to get hold of but i'm like i don't apologize because i know spending my time and running around running like an idiot and it's just i'm only prepared to do so much right mm. what there's a i can't find it but there, there's something about this simplicity um, which we've, t- we've touched upon with rate of sale um, and that kind of 70, cutting away 70% and just focusing on that 30%, a bit like the 80 20 rule. I know so many people have asked me this, they're like, ask about rate of sale, how do you drive the rate of sale? And again, with all of this today, it's been case by case. But if we were to look at the sort of the 30% that actually moves the needle, whether it's like driving the rate of sale in any retailer and again it's case by case what would you say is that 30 percent and because i think people listening to this like right just get rid of that so we've we've tried yeah. i remember trying so many stupid things that just don't move the needle <laughs> yeah and i mean just to rewind a bit on that i think the biggest thing is is that people get excited about revenue growth but quite under look overlook sometimes that that is often built by distribution not rare sale and it's what I call hollow revenue because at some point in time, if you're right, sorry, go back on that. Sorry, so you so. see all these businesses scaling, right? Yeah. So I've had people put business plans in front of me, which is you've gone, they've gone half a million, 1.3 million, two and a half, six million. Oh, look at us are flying. Right? And I'll look at it all. I'm like, right, can you just show me how your store counts? I number of stores you've gone, how many stores you've been across those time periods? Okay, right, I can see that now. Can you just show me the rate of sale? Oh, right, okay. So actually, I can see you got the revenue growth and you're now gone from. 200 stores year one to now being 4,000 stores. But you're telling me in the main supermarkets, your average unit rate of sales only three units per store per week. Yeah, that's not going to stay. So that's the first thing I say when I look at businesses. Why is, I don't, I'm so, sorry, but so, so. Because if, so, so, distrib- so if, you build, if you're building your revenue and growth of distribution, i.e. the number of stores you're in. Yeah. And that's obviously also, it's called stocking points as well. So like if you've got, three lines in 3,000 stores, you've got 9,000 stocking points. That makes sense? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's all very well. That's building scale. But if the products in those stores isn't turning, i.e. your rate of sale, it isn't turning well enough, that will start going backwards at some point. And I've seen it time again where we've seen some brands and everybody's going, God, look at their turnover. But all of a sudden, it's not, the rate of sale isn't where it needs to be. D-list, D-list, D-list. And all of a sudden, the rate of sale, sorry, the revenue starts dropping back and back and back. And that's because they've, based, say that first 200 waitress stores, yeah. the weight, the rate of sale was really high because it was in the right stores. Yeah, but and they've then also kind of rolled out more. They've probably right. rolled out more, but they've also just been obsessed with rolling out without actually thinking, which is exactly why your question is spot on. Right, I need to obsess about rate of sale. So whether you're in 200 stores, whether you're in 5,000 stores, what is the best way to drive rate of sale is what your question is, right? 
And I think fundamentally it's, you know, it comes down to me, which is don't care what anybody says, trying to influence as much as possible a, a closest proximity to where your product is, 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 is merchandised or stocked is the most important thing, right? And, you know, I don't care what anybody says, even from a marketing perspective, promotions, the right promotions, i.e. if you're not half pricing, bog off, thing, bog off buy one, get them free, et cetera, et cetera, promotions is the best way to drive trial on your product. Okay, and I still maintain that, and that's really important. I also say to say to entrepreneurs and startups, retailers will push very heavily on everyday low price EDLP. Be careful because I can tell you now, if you invest all your money in EDLP, you'll make less return than you will by having a the right level of RSP or, or MSSP, whatever you want to call it, which is obviously a recommended selling price, but then having your promotions alongside it because in the UK in particular. We have an ingrained culture which is not going to change, which is people, a lot of people, particularly on secondary brands, will shop wherever there's a red or yellow sticker, right? Because mm. they all deal, we're all deal junkies, right? And it's very unique to have a brand that, there are obviously exceptions, but it's very unique to have brands that can maintain and grow a rate of sale without having to promote. Um, and it's all very well saying, well, drop my everyday price from £1.50 to £1.20, because that's what the retailer strategy is, as part of them fighting things like discounters and stuff you won't get payback on that versus putting that same into that same amount of funding into promo, a promotional plan that gets you down to the same average price. How much is too much promo? Because I think, again, that can go... Where- depends on the category. Depends on the category. Juice, soft drinks, 68% of volume sold on deal, right? It's frightening. Ice cream is 90% of volume sold on deal. But then you can go into a category, um, you know, in like household, for example, toilet roll or something like that. And actually that's probably more like 30, 40%. So Interesting, I think it, yeah. it, changes by, it changes by category, but it's not just the amount sold on deal. It's also the average discount you have to give. So if you look at um, the certain categories where actually they just heavily discount because that's what they have to do. It's always on like a half price or bob. I mean, a good example is, it's like, I mean, Christ, toothbrushes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You always see, you know, the big, PNGs in this world and stuff like that, and and you know, you'll see the whole time again lots of those items on half price. No different than obviously things like you know razor blades and stuff are quite often you know the actual the razors are on massive discounts because guess what you get somebody to buy the razor and then the blades is where the money you know the margin comes in yeah. So I think it varies by um, by category, but this is where you also this is where the data can help you because when Vitacoco for and took on Innocent and Naked and et cetera, and Zico, which was another Pepsi brand. Um, we actually went too low on average price. We went head to head with Innocent and with those other brands and just promoted, over promoted. We then had to, over a period of time, nudge that back up to what we realized was that because we basically were buying volume we didn't need to buy. We're discounting more than we needed to because the data was showing us we didn't need to go to that low, which was actually quite humbling because. You know, we were very respectful of innocent, et cetera, but we then use our own analysis. And again, this way, this is where insights comes in. And we then worked out what was the right average price for us to be successful going forward. So promotions is a key way, obviously sampling and stuff in store. So particularly where you've got a product where, you know, you'd really need somebody to taste it. Cause that's one of the biggest things, which is, and it's, it's costly, but some products you don't, consumers don't get how good they are until they actually taste it. Right. Yeah. And it's already all talking on a billboard or whatever, or on a shelf bar about how good it is. It's like, you know, when we had Bear, we were just sampling every, I mean, we did consumer shows 46 out of the first 52 weekends of the year because that was the only way we could basically get them to taste it, but also importantly, explain to them what difference was between this versus the fact everything else they were already buying was more like sweets, you know, co- you know, confectionery because it was glue coming out of an extruded line. It wasn't softly baked fruit. Um, and then I think the other, the other big tool you've got these days as well is that um, a number of retailers obviously have their loyalty cards, but also have their, Tesco's.com, Sainsbury's.com. It's, you know, buying search terms are key key for you. So, you know, for example, with Buy With Me, whether it's granola or cereal or gut health or, you know, digestive, whatever, digestive health, or whatever, buying those search terms and finding ways you can actually specifically target your consumer or else knowing what I talked about earlier, what else is in your bar- basket and doing partnerships or else making your brand pop up with a promotion next to something that, that somebody already puts in their basket. All those things about being precision drill, that's what I advise. And where I get nervous is when I see brands which are still in early days, but maybe let's say they're broken into 1,000 or 500 supermarket stores, yet they're doing advertising on the, uh, on the, on the tube or on the underground. And you're like, how much does that cost you? And 
okay, you're only available in a thousand stores across across the UK. How are you going to get payback on that? Because nobody knows where to buy your product. Just spend that money where you are because you know then if you can influence a purchase, then you've got a good chance that person will come back and repurchase because they know where to buy it from. Mm. That's why I think Jimmy did so well. I, th- I think they did their first out of home thing. Yeah. Um, conscious of time, I know you've yeah, got to get back, mate. Um, yeah. But yeah, let, let's wrap that up there. I mean, yeah, I've, I've loved that. I think we could keep, I, I could keep going, but um, we'll have to do another one hopefully at some point. That's been good. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Giles. <laughs>